pollution, there'll be no pollution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. Howdy ho, Deconstructorinos. Ginger Duggar has written a book just for you. <laughs> Ginger Duggar uh, has written a book that is somehow for a lot of people and also for very few people. Yeah, we'll uh, uh, talk about specifically who this book is for on this episode today. This is the Leaving Eden podcast with you. As always, is cult expert Sadie Carpenter. How you doing today, cult expert Sadie Carpenter? How's life? Uh, I'm I'm doing fantastic. This entire book tour, Ginger has been shying away from calling the IBLP a cult. Um, and usually her excuse is, I'm not a cult expert, so I don't really know for sure. Um, I am a cult expert, and the IBLP is absolutely a cult. Thankful I could clear that up for you today. As always, my name is Gabrielle Hakoen. I am here with Sadie Carpenter on this show. Today, as we've said, we're talking about Ginger... Duggar Vuolo's new book. It's called Becoming Free Indeed. It came out on Tuesday, uh, 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 January 31st. Sadie and I have both read the entirety of this book. Yep. <laughs> Initial thoughts? Anything you want to? This book was pretty much what I expected. And it makes it it's so much what I expected that I wonder if I could have sat down and written this and then compared it like I could have written my own version and then compared it to what gender wrote and and to see how close I could get <laughs> like if you fed a becoming free indeed into an AI <laughs> and then told it to like like and told it to spit out something like what would come out <laughs> yeah just a bunch of um Bill Gothard's worst moments and John MacArthur quotes and a lot of New Testament scripture verses and just see what happens yeah, um, I think I can sum up most of what is in this book with one quote, I think, from the final chapter of the book. Because if, if you follow me on social media and you follow the podcast on social media, you'll have seen that I was not particularly uh, enjoying of this uh, work of literature. Uh, but here's a quote from the final chapter of the book that I think sums up what its message is pretty well. And in, in it, Ginger says, if the end of your disentangling journey is anything other than Jesus, us, you've done it wrong. If your life is centered on anything other than him, then you need to start disentangling. So you put that quote in the doc and I thought you were being sarcastic because I had not gotten to that chapter yet when you put this quote in the, in the, um, the notes document for this episode. <laughs> And I thought you were just being snarky, and then that turned out that that is an actual That's quote, an actual quote. <laughs> from this book. I don't know what I expected from this book. Uh, I went into this with actually the expectations of her saying that it was a tell-all book, despite the fact that she said that it's not a tell-all book, because I just assumed that it was going to be anyway. If somebody says that their book is not a tell-all, there are two ways that that turns out. Number one, it's a tell all and there's a lot of tea in there. Or number two, it's a tell absolutely nothing. Yeah. And this is the second of those. It, it usually is. Anyway, we're, th we're, we're here. We're talking about this book today. We're going to get into our, uh, our, our in-depth analysis of this book. But before we get into that, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult. Uh, also known as the IFB. It's the cult in which she was raised. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults, including uh, Jonestown, um, Branch Davidians, FLDS, and the IBLP. Uh, we talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. And it is our primary goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, there's a couple of things that you can do to support us. Number one, hit that subscribe button. Get those new episodes right when they come out on Monday morning. You can join our Patreon 
at patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast, where you will get an extended version of most of our episodes. So if you like this episode, there will be an extended version of today's episode, uh, extended ad free, uh, uncensored, and that'll be on patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. If you want to talk about what's in this episode with other fans of the show, you can join our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, and you can join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Anything else I got to say before we go? Oh, you know what? One more thing. If if this is your first time listening to this show, you can go and check out episode 57, which is a primer episode for brand new listeners to the Leaving Eden podcast, and that'll tell you all the, the, the terminology that you're going to need to know going forward if you really want, want to get into the show. Uh, we made it specifically for new listeners. Anything else I need to say before we get into thanking the patrons, Sadie? Uh, I don't think so. Well, without further ado... I need to, I'm going to thank the patrons. Sadie's going to give the TW for this episode, and then we're just going to get right to it. So we have two, I gave it all to your patrons. Those are Melissa Mosley and Kathleen Moncrief. Uh, coming very soon, I have a new special outtakes and extremely like weird stuff that we've said on mic that absolutely will never make it into an episode. Uh, but we've got that reel coming out real soon. Um, for you guys who are in the I Gave It All tier of our Patreon. Um, and we really do appreciate you guys. And we also appreciate our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons as well. Your names are Alex Todd, Alicia Guild, Allie Allen. Wow, is Allie Allen a new one? I think Allie I Allen think is so. a new one. Well, thank you, Allie Allen. Anisha Patel, Brittany, Brooke Tully, Krissa, Crystal Patterson, Dear Ethan Hansen, The Musical, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fairlosser, Hannah Ross, Hope, Norum, Horton Hears a Shane. That's a, a funny name. I get a kick out of that every time I read it. It's Janine Callan, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jana K. Terwee, Kristen Marie, Lauren Vanderwall, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Lorena Watson. MC Crunchwrap, hashtag the boy who cried sauce, Michaela Upright, Madeline Antrim, Marlena Stuve, Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arendt, Rob the Methodist, Sarah Reese, Scooby Sleuth, Stephanie Johnson, Susie, Tara McNamara, the Lady Rabbi, part of the clergy crew, Walnut, son of Walnut, Wendy Dalton, and as always, Wes the Cowboy. Thank you so much to our Faith Promise Missions, to your patrons, our I Gave It All to Your Patrons, and everybody who is subscribed to our Patreon. We love you guys so much. You guys really keep the lights on for us and make it possible for us to make this show. Yeah, I wanted to say a special thank you to our patrons this week because having podcast funds means that we can buy books and review them so that you don't have to. Yeah, I would absolutely never have spent my own money on this book uh, in a million years. But hopefully the fact that we spent money on it prevents a hundred other people from going to spend money on it. That's the idea. We read this so you don't have to. That's honestly what I believe. Don't You don't need to read this book. It's stupid, but we're going to tell you why. <laughs> Sadie, give us the CW, the TW, uh, all of that, and then we'll get right into it. You got it. So in general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we'll mention at least a few of those topics, but we try very hard to avoid any graphic detail about those topics unless it's highly relevant to the story that we're telling on that particular day. And if we do feel that we need to go into detail, we'll give you an additional trigger warning right before we start so that you can skip ahead if needed. Today, we are talking about Ginger Duggar Vuolo's 
book that has come out in which she goes into stories about her life. We will be talking in detail about the IBLP and some of the cult methods of control that are used in that group. Um, we'll also be talking kind of tangentially about some homophobia, homophobia and misogyny. Uh, I'll give you a heads up if I'm going to quote anybody being especially heinous. I think that's it. Is there anything else that we need to TW for today? Also, just that a lot of the quotes that we're going to be reading from Ginger are extremely gaslighty. Yeah, they're very Christianese. They can come off condescending. They can come off gaslighty. So if that's something that's going to bother you in, in particular, uh, just a heads up for that. So so let's do this. Let's get into it. Um, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So Ginger's written this book. It's called Becoming Free Indeed. Uh, by Ginger Duggar Vuolo, uh, who is the the co writer on this, Corey Williams, and and it's interesting. So the title of this book is Becoming Free Indeed, and that is actually I, I in reading the book, she is very clear that the title of this book is a dig at the snarkers. There are like a few very sanctimonious passages in reference to the snarkers themselves in this book, in like even the beginning of this book. I want to get something out of the way right at the beginning. Okay. I am not one of the OG snarkers. Before I met Sadie and started doing this podcast, I had no idea who the Duggars were. I'd never heard of them. I'd never heard the name Duggar before. I wasn't on any free ginger message boards. The only genuine interest I have in the Duggars is in the way that this sh show like shows cult control and the way that they are an example of cult control within society. Personally, I do not care whether Ginger deconstructs or not. I have no emotional investment in her as a person or as a celebrity or as a public figure in any way. To be honest, though, as far as snarkers go, there is very little in this book that I think would be of any interest to snarkers. There was a celebrity memoirs podcast who was going to they were going to review this book and they ended up just scrapping the episode because there was so little of interest on a this is a celebrity memoir friend that's really interesting and a lot of people tagged me in it and i said don't worry i'm gonna come through with the theological takes on this uh which is more my field of expertise people like me were expecting a tell-all and that's not what this book is it's it, i mean but it's very deliberate on her part the criticism that I have for her over this book is not because I wish that she would deconstruct further or because I wish that she would become an atheist or a progressive Christian or something. It's because I see the effect of her brand of conservative Christianity and, and like her advocacy for various forms of, of quote unquote biblical patriarchy as a negative influence on society. And that affects everybody. That affects me. That affects you, Sadie. That affects the listeners. That affects everybody out on the street, just like in general throughout society. Right. And then some of yeah. us are more affected than other of us, depending on tons and tons of intersections. Even just like, you know, it, it could be, you know, people passing laws that are negatively affecting one group or another. It could just be people who are very really raised in these groups that have to deal with that in a very real way. So it could be general. It could be very acute. My opinion is that the ideas that she is pushing in this book are at best counterproductive uh, and at worst manipulative and damaging towards anybody who has left or is thinking of leaving the IBLP or a different branch of Christian fundamentalism. But also I think that's why, you know, that's why me and Sadie or, or Sadie especially are, are well positioned to talk about this book because the leaving Eden podcast isn't primarily a fundy snark show. It's a show about deconstruction. It's a show about religion. And those are the main topics of becoming free indeed. Yes. So the whole theme of the book is around uh, freedom and Christian liberty and what that means to Ginger. She grew up being taught that the greatest freedom was in following all of the rules of the IBLP, because doing so makes you spiritually free. It frees you from negative and worldly and sinful, sinful influences. And when you follow those principles, you will feel free because you, you you are free in Christ as a Christian and you know that you're going to heaven and all you have to do is follow these 1,872 simple rules for life. It's, it's fine. It's easy. She 
seems to be under the impression that people out in the world, people like you and me, who are considered worldly by those standards, live in complete freedom and that we don't place any kind of restrictions on ourselves, and that people who live out in the world have no moral compass. Yeah. That we are just doing whatever we want, whenever we want. And the only rules we're, we're following are maybe sometimes following the law of the country in which we live. And Ginger believes that neither one of those things is true freedom, but that she has found true freedom in her new understanding of Christianity. Today, we're going to take that all of that apart, unpack all of that together. If I had a nickel for every time Ginger said in this book, Jesus sets you free, like... Yeah, uh, but if you had a nickel for every time she defines the word freedom, you would have no nickels. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Which is kind of my issue, my my primary issue with this book. Sadie, who who is this book for? Who does she just say this book for? I'm, Who does she I'm, I'm, say those this are, Those are different questions. <laughs> so Ginger says that this book is for those who are, quote, struggling to see who Jesus really is. She says that it is also for people who are still in the IBLP. She also talks later in the book about it, about the book being for people who she believes that she influenced with her previous book, Growing Up Duggar, uh, almost Oh, uh, I'm sorry if I led you down the wrong path and I want to set the record straight. So it's for it's for people uh, like me who were raised in conservative fundamentalist Christianity and have left conservative fundamentalist Christianity because those people like me, she wants to pull back onto a path that's closer to the path that she's following now. It's for people in the IBLP because she wants them to get out of the IBLP and follow a path closer to the path that she's following now. And it's for the people that she worries that she influenced in the past. Uh, she talks about girls that would come up to her at book signings and say, well, the rest of my family wears pants, but I've decided now to only wear long skirts because I read your book and I want to be just like you. And now she feels like she's misled those people and, you guessed it, she wants to bring them on a path closer to the path that she's following now. <laughs> uh, we do get a, a nice, <laughs> criticism aside, we do get a nice little play on words in that introduction. She says, quote, I'm hopeful my story can be helpful if you realize someone you've been looking to for wisdom is lacking the wisdom you need most. She gets a lot more explicit about her uh, dislike of Bill Gothard and his teachings later in the book. I did think that was a clever little play on words referencing the wisdom booklets. If you want to know uh, some of the bizarre things that are in the Bill Gothard wisdom booklets, we what have is several better, episodes. Buzzards or eagles? Yeah, dude, wait, he's, he's like ranking which bird is best in these. Like, which bird I is best? <laughs> Bears, beats, Battlestar Galactica. Okay. We we have a couple episodes about uh, where where we really go into these wisdom booklets and break them down. I think it's episode forty two and episode forty three from uh, July of twenty twenty one. In reading this book, I think th there's a few main overarching points. She's very uh, uh, she she doesn't really like to get straight to the point on anything she says. She she's a bit meandering. But there are four there are three like main core stipulations that that uh that that kind of set the scope for everything else that she says in this book um and i've kind of like distilled these down so Great. can i can i go through these yeah absolutely point number one christianity versus man-made religions okay so her first point is that the bible was written by god and every word of it is 100 percent historically accurate and this is proven because prophecies in the bible are fulfilled in the bible Religions that are not Christianity or that include extra biblical commandments and traditions are man-made religions. And she uses the word, the term man-made religions quite often. Man-made religion is anything that isn't evangelical Christianity. It, it's anything that isn't her specific brand of Christianity that she perceives to be the most simplistically true to the Bible. Point number two is is uh, she she defines the terms deconstruction versus disentanglement. <sighs> this is the, the <laughs> this is the doozy right here. Okay, deconstruction. Um, if you listen to this show, or if you're you know on the snark boards or, or whatever, um, is is a, a common term that is used 
to uh, used for the process of taking apart the teachings that you grew up with piece by piece and deciding what you want to keep and what you want to throw away based on what is right for you. This process often takes a lifetime. Um, as as many of our listeners who are ex fundamentalists know, they, like this is a long, long, long process. Ginger has uh, th- defines another word, which I th- I guess is like I haven't heard this word before, but this is like an alternative to deconstruction. She says disentanglement uh, uh, is the process of just removing the teachings of man made religions like the IBLP and leaving only pure biblical teachings deconstruction is bad because it might lead you to atheism or agnosticism or a different non-christian religious tradition or faith tradition i have not heard this disentanglement term before i think it's a genderism disentanglement ginger says is good because it leads you to jesus if anything happened to you during your time in the IBLP or as a result of IBLP legalism or as a part of a group that claimed to be Christian but was really a, scare quotes, man-made religion, they clearly weren't following what the Bible truly says. So that wasn't actually Christianity that hurt you. That was man-made religion that hurt you. Therefore, you don't have a valid reason to leave Christianity. Therefore, deconstruction is bad. That's point number two that that I've kind of of distilled down. Can I make an official statement on this point? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Is that your official statement? (laughs) That's my official statement. (laughs) Yeah, it's 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 complete and utter bullshit. It's extremely manipulative. Point number three is. If you trust in Jesus, then nothing that happens in your life matters because Jesus loves you, and when you die, you get to go to heaven. Leave your life decisions up to other people who know the Bible better than you. It's okay to be a mindless Jesus zombie. Just don't be a mindless Bill Gothard zombie. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the the primary objective of this book, it seems to me, is to almost like to 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 defend the reputation of Christianity and to deflect any criticism that people have of Christianity by using the no true Scotsman fallacy and just saying, oh, well, that was actually man-made religion, not Christianity that hurt you. Right. And I, if you would like a, a perspective on this from somebody who is now a non-believer but is very familiar with evangelical Christianity, uh, I would definitely suggest you check out at Chrissy Stroop on Twitter. I can tag her in all of our official Twitter posts and things about this. She is very good at explaining why this is a fallacy and why this does not work. So do you want to, those are, that's like kind of our introduction. Do you want to get into like the actual meat of this text? Yeah. So I had a note about the style in the, the style in the first half versus the style in the second half. So the first half of the book, uh, I would describe the style as colloquial, friendly, and self-effacing in a fun way. And then later in the book, it becomes much more preachy and patronizing. There it was a tiny bit of Duggar trivia um, that we may have not actually heard before in the first chapter, which at this point feels like snarker bait. We find out that, that Ginger's deconstruction, or <clears throat> excuse me, disentanglement, was... <laughs> <laughs> apparently started because Jeremy showed her the movie The Truman Show. That seems very <laughs> trippy to somebody who was raised both on television and as a fundamentalist. I mean, that's that's really understandable though. And like when she said when she told that story in the book, I was like, you know, that's a really relatable story and that mm-hmm. like that 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 did make me feel sympathy for her. But it did also feel like she put that in there just to keep the snarkers interested in reading her giant long book on Jesus. Yeah, we'll get to that. So she talks about um, the beginnings of the Free Gender Forum, and she talks about the incident where her diary was stolen. It's nothing new. It's nothing that we haven't heard before about these incidents. It's actually less than she writes in her previous book with Jeremy, which is The Hope We Hold. There's a very sanctimonious passage in chapter one, and I feel like when I read this passage, I started to really understand where this book was going. 
Um, she talks about how the Free Gender Forum wanted her to have, quote, limitless freedom, but that's not what she really needed. Continuing that quote, they think complete freedom is the ticket to happiness. But what she needs is not complete freedom. What she needs is freedom in Jesus. She says she really wants to, She when she was younger, she really wanted to live in the city. And now she enjoys living in the city because, quote, living in the city is an opportunity for me to serve others and maximize the life God has given me. What does that mean, though? Does that mean that she wants to be visibly Christian in the den of sin that is Hollywood? In order to be like a light to other people? What it means is she wants to live in a city in a nice house and like eat foodie food and dress fashionably. But she can't (laughs) say that. (laughs) So what she has to say is, this maximizes the life that God gave me. Yeah. And so if you ever see uh, Ginger at Nobu, just know that she is maximizing the life that God gave her. In all seriousness, for somebody who has such a like such a chip on her shoulder about how the world doesn't accept conservative evangelical Christianity. She is so judgmental of cities in this passage. She ingested like in the beginning when the Duggars got to go to a city to film their, their show, they enjoyed big cities. And that was like a personality trait that may that she's like, that's probably the thing that made people want to start free ginger was they saw that I liked being in a city, like as if like being from where she's from liking a city is like a weird personality quirk. Well, it is. If you grow up in the IDLP in Arkansas and you like big cities, that is a major personality trait. That's just so weird to for me. This to is get also my head a culture that. where girls and AFAB people don't get to have personalities. So that's about as uh, exciting as it gets. <laughs> so f- following on <clears throat> in chapter one here, <laughs> the maybe the funniest thing in this book, I don't know, there were a few, but this one was extremely funny. She just goes to town on Joshua Harris, who was the author of I Kiss Dating Goodbye. She just just lamb blasts him for having left the faith and he's not even a Christian anymore. And how terrible. What's really funny is that she calls him the leader of the deconstruction movement. <laughs> and, I don't think and no disrespect to Joshua Harris, like... I have mixed feelings about him, but but in general, I feel like he is trying and doing pretty good work. I don't mean any disrespect to him, but he is not the leader of the deconstruction movement. That's ridiculous. That's, I mean, it's not like a, a movement with a leader. It's a, <laughs> like, it's, it's a bunch of people who have, who have, who are together trying to figure out what their lives look like without the thing that they were raised with. That's just, you know what? Th- this is uh, like when somebody uh, says, Oh, so-and-so is the head of Antifa. Exactly. Th- this Perfect is exactly example. that. Um, yeah, that cracked me up. Yeah. I, I, I want to move on just real quick and, and discuss one quote, this one quote that I think says so much about where this book is going. This is a direct quote from the book. She says, I am not the best judge of what is best for me. I want to do a little more context around that quote, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. So the context around that is unfettered freedom does not produce the good life. In the end, it often leads to more bondage. Why? Because it puts me in charge of my life and I am not the best judge of what's best for me. So that's Calvinism. Yes. About the, the, the uh, I don't need to be in charge of my own life bit. And and so while Ginger, as we said earlier, Ginger never like adequately defines what freedom is, um, except for saying Jesus will set you free. We get hints of it where basically what, what Ginger is talking about is, when she says freedom is the freedom from ever having to make a decision in her life ever again. And the freedom from taking any level of responsibility or accountability for your actions or, and this is also very important, or assigning responsibility for anything to anybody for any reason because everything is God's will. So I would like to bring in an illustration that I heard a lot around the topic of freedom growing up in the IFB 
And that is the illustration of bumper bowling. Have you ever done bumper bowling? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you go bowling, but they have the, the bumpers over the gutter. Yeah, so they put can't... little little guards up so your ball can go anywhere across the bowling lane, but it can't go into the gutter. I have heard that illustration applied to living a godly Christian life in a lot of ways. So the rules and the boundaries that you put up on yourself as a Christian are those bumpers, the lane bumpers, and you have freedom because your bowling ball can go anywhere it wants between these bumpers. The rules just keep you from falling into the gutter, which is sin. The thing is that I have heard that applied to IBLP style, extremely strict rules. I've heard it applied to IFB rules a thousand times. And now Ginger is applying the same argument to her new, looser, uh, <laughs> reformed, semi-modern Christian rules. So it frustrates me that that she is using the the same terminology to describe a slightly different thing. Yeah. So when she says the good life, what is she talking about there? <sighs> she doesn't define that either, does she? The good life is a term that she uses over and over and over again. Is this a term that is common within Christian fundamentalist circles? Because I've never heard this one before, even though we've been, you know, doing the show for years and years and years. So this is not a term that I heard growing up, which leads me to assume that it is a term that her new church group uses frequently. I did not take the time to look up their definition of it because I had already clicked on more articles than I wish to from their websites. I mean, it just seems like something where she can just say it and it's a buzzword and you know what she's saying, except I don't know what she's saying. In this chapter, she talks about how man-made religious rules provide a sense of freedom because if you are following all the rules, it makes you feel confident that you are doing everything right and making God happy, which was a, a, a moment of near self-awareness, just a near, a near miss with self-awareness in this book. But it, it is a good point. That, it, that is a correct point. Um, when you have a list of rules that governs everything that you wear, how you do your hair, how you do your makeup, what music you listen to, where you do and don't go, what you do and don't do, you go to bed at night and you think, well, I haven't broken any of the rules today. God must be pleased with me. And it, it gives you a sense of peace. Then she she will go on in the next couple chapters to talk about how the specific rules of, of the IBLP destroyed that sense of peace by making the rules feel unattainable. I had one other quote from this chapter, and we can move on to kind of that anxiety that she describes. Uh, the last quote that I had from chapter one was, I am messed up because of sin, and no amount of good behavior is going to fix that. I need freedom from myself, not freedom from the world around me. Which is, that's uh, just more Calvin. The, the I am messed up because of sin. There's there's a lot of, that phrase comes up multiple times in this book, and that is a uh, total depravity shining through. If you want to know more about Calvinism, um, we did an episode two weeks ago, I think it's episode 117, where we talk all about Calvinism um, and, and, and what that entails. Okay. And we, we set that up to be right before this episode because I had a hunch that this would get referenced a lot in Ginger's book. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you want to move on to chapter two? Yes. So chapter two is where Ginger gets deeper into the sense of anxiety that she felt growing up and how specifically the IBLP teachings made her feel like she was never fully following the rules. This is maybe the most relatable part of the book for me. There were parts of this chapter into almost entire paragraphs of things that she was saying. I was uh, reading that and I was thinking that could have been something that you said on this show. On oh, this absolutely. Podcast. She says that, that growing up, she was never hiding what she calls a dark, rebellious spirit, but that she was actually constantly in a state of fear. She describes her experience with anxiety as a child and young teenager in a way that sounds so similar to what I experienced. Uh, fundamentalism is an anxiety factory for children. And sometimes that presents as religious perfectionism or religious anxiety and obsession 
But sometimes that's only a small part of how this anxiety presents. From all of the hundreds of survivors that I've spoken to and read stories from, I really think that more generalized anxiety about non-religious topics is a common side effect of the baked-in religious anxiety of fundamentalism. So she characterizes, we uh, we all, I think, are aware, if you know anything about Ginger, that she uh, was participating in some eating disorder behavior that would probably have landed her an ED diagnosis if her parents believed in such things when she was a teenager. She characterizes that as being tied to anxiety, which is an interesting take that I do not believe I've heard from her before. So as a teenager, she wouldn't have had a lot of exposure to media, mainstream TV, modeling photos, things that other people might cite as a reason for eating disorder behavior or thoughts. Ginger says that the main driver of this behavior for her was her anxiety about what other people thought of her, which I think is maybe actual self-awareness. That's extremely relatable, though. Yeah. And I'm I am on it. There are a couple of moments in this book where, aside from all of the things that I don't agree with, I would look Ginger in the face and, and say, wow, I'm really glad that you figured that out about yourself. Just genuinely genuinely happy that she was able to come to that realization and hope it helps her in the future. The issue is that then she turns this back to the Christianese stuff. She informs us that she was anxious because she didn't really love God. Uh. Yeah. So the problem wasn't that she was raised in a anxiety factory. The problem was, well, the anxiety factory that I was raised in only got to me because I didn't really understand who God was. So Ginger describes an epiphany when she was 13. She realized that she had been trying to follow the rules for the wrong reasons. Like she's on The Bachelor. Right. She was not there for the right reasons. (laughs) She had been... (laughs) She had been trying to follow the rules because she was worried about what other people would think of her if she broke the rules, instead of following the rules because she thought they pleased God. Then she became a true Christian, according to her. Uh, This is when she became a true Christian. And after this epiphany, her anxiety lessened because now she had true faith and she was putting God first. Uh, Uh, this is... So, Ginger describes after... So, after this becoming a true Christian incident, she describes still feeling a lot of anxiety. So, I don't know why she said that the anxiety went down when she continues to spend, like, three more chapters talking about how bad her anxiety was after. Um, She describes feeling paralyzed. Like, God wants me to make the right choice in this situation, but what do I do if I don't know what the right choice is? I do really identify with this. I feel like I could have written this, this particular section in my early deconstruction. So I really, I do empathize a lot with this issue. Do you feel as if, so if, if you had been under the same microscope during your deconstruction that, that, um, that, that she was during this time, if you'd been on television, do you think that maybe you'd have turned out differently? Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. I think that that Ginger's, I think it's more than being on television because Ginger, she'll talk about this more later in, in the book, but she was raised to see her entire worth as a person wrapped up in being a wife and a mother. And I think her deconstruction didn't, or sorry, disentanglement didn't really start until after she was already a wife and on her way to being a mother. So I think that that family pressures play as much a role in where she has ended up as the pressures of the public eye. That's just my guess. So Ginger talks about fearing if she took time to play a game with her family, but God wanted her to read the Bible or pray during that time instead, then God would kill the whole family in a car accident on the way home from the rink in order to punish her for not listening to a command that she didn't hear. I mean, that's very par for the course as far as fundamentalist yep. teachings go. Mm-hmm. We talked about examples of we, the brain in the jar story mm-hmm. comes to mind. It's always a car accident. Because that's the easiest deus ex machina. Yeah. In the next part of the story, um, 
in in, the, in this part of the story, when she's wondering whether to read her her, her Bible or play broomball, she says that she just wanted somebody, um, ostensibly Jim Bob, to tell her what to do so that she could make the uh, air quotes uh, right decision. Because it's easy to do the right thing when you're not the person who has to make the decision about what is right and what is wrong. This is like, and this is a worldview where if you get further into the book, this is a worldview that she has not gotten away from. I want you guys to think of uh, back to the the quote from the beginning that we read, which is, I am not the best judge of what is best for me. So she wants, st- she still wants somebody else to make all of her decisions for her. That person just isn't Bill Gothard or her father anymore. Right. So she talks here and a couple other places in the book about the Gothard umbrella of authority. And under Bill Gothard's teachings, people are always to be in obedience to the God-given authorities in their life, primarily their parents. So Ginger found a loophole to this issue of does God want me to read the Bible or is he chill if I go play a game with my family? Because if her father told her to do something, then she was automatically doing the right thing if she obeyed him. So it almost sounds like she was trying to subtly push Jim Bob into commanding her to play a game with the family, because then if it was a command from him, she was obeying her parents and it was automatically the most righteous thing to do. And that took the pressure off of her to make the right decision. And I really do, as much as I'm going to laugh and snark my way through parts of this episode, I really do empathize with that troublemaking decisions and and all of that. This is also why we planned the Calvinism episode to come out shortly before this one, because of the concept that it's easier to have someone else make decisions for you. I think that's the root. I know that that is not all that Calvinism entails and that it's a much deeper and richer doctrine than that, but I think this concept is the root of the fundamentalist to Calvinist pipeline because it trades all of these rules that govern your life for the belief that your actions are predetermined by God. And I, again, I empathize. It is hard to learn how to make decisions. I remember even when I was still IFB and in early deconstruction times, one of the toughest things I had to do on a regular basis was buy toothpaste because there are too many options. Really? It's overwhelming. There are so many options. There are so many price points. There are so many different functions and features of all of these different toothpastes. And it it drives, it still kind of drives me a little bit nuts to, <laughs> to have to go buy toothpaste. It wasn't that I felt like God had a plan of the correct toothpaste for me to buy and I would be sinning if I bought the wrong one. It was that I was so unused to making decisions for myself that I did not have the tools to make a decision for myself. And I did not have a concept of just pick one because I had been so indoctrinated into this idea that there is always a right and a wrong choice. Man. I mean, it's like option paralysis, isn't it? Yes. Which is a major problem for ex-fundamentalists, let me tell you. So there were just so few areas in my life where I needed to exercise making a choice for myself that I did not know how to cope when I did have freedom of choice and there was not a black and white right or wrong answer. Well, the paradox of this is, as the great Neil Peart once said, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Yes, exactly. Uh, Like, so... And this is why this book feels so absurd to me, because it feels like Ginger is addressing the people who put all of the work in i mean it wasn't just like oh do i believe this or do i believe that do i want to uh have sex outside of marriage things like that which are bigger questions it's like i go to the store and what toothpaste do i buy i feel like she's talking to the people who had to learn to make all those decisions for themselves and then she's lecturing at them look at me i didn't do any of the work to learn to make decisions for myself and i just went straight to calvinism and dismissed the idea of free will entirely p.s i'm better than you because i'm still a christian (laughs) that is exactly what it feels like i'm sure that i'll dig into this a little bit deeper as we get into the more and more preachy and um, patronizing parts of this book was it chapter eight that gets like 
Yeah, it starts getting bad around chapter eight. Um, but I I want to have sympathy for her. Like I really do, because I have been through this and I know it's tough. And and I know that having to learn to make decisions for yourself is unpleasant. Uh, let's get to a funny quote. Uh she says she says in this chapter that rock and roll promotes, quote, a self-absorbed lifestyle. Right. Is this when she's talking about the roots of the IBLP and, and where it came from? Yeah, I think so. And she's like, well, the IBLP came about because uh, Bill Gothard wanted to show people the way when people were getting into rock and roll, which was bad. and They shouldn't have been getting into it. Like, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but like, it's so funny because the most the most self absorbed people that I've ever met are people who are religiously devout and believe that it is up to them personally to save the world. Yeah, like main character syndrome is a core tenet of their religious beliefs. The least self absorbed people that I've ever met. Uh, and this is personal experience uh, because when you live in Portland, you meet you meet these sorts of people. The least self absorbed people that I've ever met are like the train hopping heavy metal crust punk nihilists who find freedom in the beliefs that their lives are entirely meaningless yeah um that was a really great point and and my point is not nearly as good uh, my point is just uh that whenever i hear her say rock and roll which she does several times in this book all i can hear is rock and or roll <laughs> <laughs> uh, at this point is when she describes the book and, and, and says that it's a theological memoir. And I want to, to make note of the, the of that she's describing this as a theological memoir because she's 29 years old and she's writing a theological memoir, especially because the, the, the crux of the book is essentially I went from listening to my dad who listens to Bill Gothard to now I listen to my husband who's a Calvinist. And right. the like the only way you find freedom is surrendering and understanding that nothing that happens in your life is your fault or responsibility because it's God's will. And just, I mean, it's not it's not that twenty nine year olds shouldn't be writing theology. I, no. I think it's a bit presumptuous to write a book about where your religious beliefs have landed when you are twenty nine. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, otherwise, uh, just for the people listening, I just wanted to to uh, clarify. Ginger never says in the book, I am a Calvinist. What she says is that she follows Jeremy's theology. Uh, she follows Jeremy Volo's theology, her husband's theology, and that he is a Reformed Baptist. And Reformed Baptist means that he is a Calvinist. So back to back to the, the theological memoir thing. This comes up later in the book. She talks about how she shouldn't have thought she had all the answers when she was 15 and wrote the book Growing Up Duggar. She has no awareness that she might be saying the same thing about this book in 15 more years. Part of her regret about the book that she wrote when she was 15 was how heavily she based it on the IBLP and their like life principles. As I said earlier, that her her main crux of this book is Bill Gothard doesn't actually teach the Bible. And right. He's not a Bible teacher, he's a false prophet. Which I agree with, but Right. She has a lot of valid criticisms of of Bill Gothard, but her solution to all of these is read your Bible more. That's not really useful, is it? That's not <sighs> it, it is. Okay, so so Bill Gothard added a lot of extra biblical rules and regulations and was not a good Bible teacher or even really a Bible teacher at all. That is a very valid point. That's the same point that we have made many times. And she also agrees with us about how his teachings were attractive in a time of uncertainty in culture. He presented a recipe that supposedly guaranteed a happy, successful life and a perfect family. She's correct about that, and if her advice was find out what the Bible really says, that wouldn't be such bad advice, but we know that her perception of what the Bible really says is heavily colored by Jeremy and by John MacArthur and John Piper and these other Reformed Christian leaders. 
So she's still relying on somebody else to tell her exactly what the Bible supposedly clearly says. One example that she gave of um, Bill Gothard being extra biblical, and I thought I thought this was really interesting because she does give good examples of this stuff. Yeah. Um, but then, like, it, or it's the sort of thing where she'll give a good example of it, and then the conclusion that she'll draw from that example is like, no, you took the absolute wrong lesson from like. Um, so the example that she gives uh, is is she says that Bill Gothard has. Uh, extra biblical extrapolation that he's teaching that adopted children are specially chosen by God. And that this is based on various biblical figures like Moses, among others who were adopted. This teaching is as she writes, as she rightly puts it extra biblical. It's not in the Bible. Then she never takes the step to say, I need to look and see what I think about these things because as much as she's decrying Bill Gothard's teaching, she's basically just saying, yeah, I went from the headship of my father to the headship of my husband, and that's much better. The thing that she actually fr- expresses frustration with is that under the IBLP, her father and Jeremy's parents still have authority over their married children when, according to Genesis, this is extra biblical. You know what I'm saying? Like She's yeah. like... So I, I have an example from my life that uh, that I feel like falls into this. Can I give a, 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 as you would put it, sermon illustration? Absolutely. So when I was in fifth grade, we read the book Sounder. Have you read the book Sounder? Do you no, know this? Are you familiar with this book? Okay. Um, or, or seen the movie. They did a movie as well. Um, it's the story about a, a, a poor black sharecropping family in the South. Um. The father of the family, I don't think I don't think the father is named. I think a lot of the characters aren't actually named. So um, but the father uh, is arrested for stealing a ham and is sentenced to hard labor. He has to go uh, do hard labor and then he ends up getting crushed to death in a rock quarry. It's horrible. And so we had to divide the class up like we d- divided half of us up. Um, half of us had to take one side. Half of us had to take the other. And we had to debate the guilt or innocence of the the man in the book based on the evidence in the book and so you know we we all had to get up in front of the class and and debate it and 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 debate our pairs you know we we were each in a pair and we had to debate it one way or the other and at the end of the at the end of class our teacher got up in front of all of us and said that we all missed the point because it didn't matter whether or not the man was guilty of a crime. It was the entire justice system that was at fault. You know what I'm saying? Like this, and obviously this is an extreme example, but I feel like ginger is really missing the, the forest for the trees here. The, the point isn't that bill Gothard's interpretation of the headship idea is extra biblical. The point is that the, the headship itself, that idea and biblical patriarchy are bad. Like, Right. And, uh, well, the thing is that now she is not living under patriarchy. Now she is living under complementarianism. And there, there, I think I can explain what's going on here. We did an episode about complementarianism as we well. Um, so Ginger is talking about how she was always raised with this idea that there is only one correct way to see religion and see the Bible, and that is Bill Gothard's way. And she was incredibly indoctrinated into that. And then she met her brother-in-law, Ben Seawald. And Ben and Jeremy were friends. And as Ben and Jessa were courting, Ginger overheard a lot of their conversations about Reformed and Calvinist doctrine. And Ginger was, for the first time, exposed to a way of looking at the Bible and Christianity that she had never been exposed to before. It blew her mind that there was more than one correct way or potentially correct way to look at this. And she was so excited about the fact that there was an an additional possibly correct way to look at this that she just jumped onto that train and, and that was the end of it because reformed doctrine, you can, you can hear all about my feelings about it in the Calvinism episode, but the truth of the matter is that it's closer to a literal interpretation of the Bible than anything Bill Gothard ever said. It is more literal, more biblical than extreme IBLP Gothardism. 
Yeah, but there's Bazooka Joe comics that are more close to the extreme interpret, like extremely literal interpretation of the Bible than anything Bill Gothard said. So true, right? <laughs> but but Ginger saw this, and I don't think she ever looked outside of this new reform doctrine that she was being exposed to or look to teachers other than her husband to be and later husband and the men who taught him and mentored him. I think in her mind, it was like, why, well, why do I have to? I grew up with this thing that I can see is extra biblical. And now I found this thing that is more biblical. So now I found the right thing. And there's just, there's no looking beyond that to, is there something that is even more biblical or is there something that fits me as a person better is there a belief system within or outside christianity that is more for me than this reform doctrine she never took that additional step i'm going to skip over a lot of what she has to say about gothard's principles because we've covered that in previous episodes but she goes through uh, a lot of his success principles unchangeables umbrella of authority that sort of thing she talks about how they affected her And she talks about how she's, quote unquote, disentangled the true parts from the extra biblical. One part that really stuck out to me is when she was talking about her identity growing up, being wrapped up in getting married and having as many children as possible, and how she loves her children, but having a dozen of them wasn't ever something she really wanted or was excited about. Ginger makes a really salient point about how this teaching excludes women who don't marry for whatever reason, uh, women who can't physically have children. She quotes Gothard, um, a particularly toxic quote of his, where he says that if there is a risk of life or a risk of health to the mother, uh, if she has more children, she should not prevent pregnancy. She should still be open to God giving her more children because if, you know, basically God will provide and if he gives you a pregnancy, he will give you the means to bring that baby into the world safely, which I fully agree is toxic and awful and terrifying. That's insane. That's a very real Gothard teaching and it's a very messed up Gothic Gothard teaching. My problem with Ginger here is that she rebuts this quote from Gothard with a quote from John Piper, who is a a reformed teacher. And the quote from John Piper is a real doozy. Here's the quote that she used. We love those big families and anyone who wants to can have a big family in this church. It's a good thing if you bring up those kids to be radical soldiers for Jesus. Uh, How is this different from the Vision Forum 200-year plan? Radical soldiers. Is John Piper selling children swords in a Christmas catalog? Uh, not that I know of. This book, it, it's just so dumb. Be, like It comes so close to her really grasping what people who she's lecturing to. Because she's lecturing to all of like the deconstructorinos. Um mm-hmm. And she's uh, she, she comes so close to grasping what all those people already understand and have like they've gone through major emotional and spiritual crises to learn to understand these things. And every time she's right at the precipice of saying something insightful, she turns around and and, and then she says, and if you look at the Bible actually says about this, it's that you need to trust in Jesus. And that is the thing that will set you free. Like Jesus Christ, Ginger, you've missed the point entirely. Oh my God. Ah, it's, it's not even that a lot of people, a lot of people deconstruct and find freedom in some other form of Christianity. And I I think I'll talk about that a little bit later down the road, but it's not that it's, it's not that that is a problem. It's that, she is she went from there's only one correct solution to life and that's bill gothard to there's only one correct solution in life and that's my new religious beliefs what really stuck with me from this part of the bo- the book is that her experiences with the gothard principles and the teachings of fundamentalism are so relatable to all of the deconstruction people i know and myself she said that she was taught that dating was a distraction from God and she should only do a courtship and not date. So when she felt any attraction to someone, she wanted to ignore that and not tell anyone and run from it because she was so afraid of displeasing God. And this went so far that she didn't even want to talk to boys 
in case she accidentally sinned. And she talks about how this was an obstacle in her marriage because she and Jeremy went straight from strangers to should we get married? And they skipped any friendship stage that there might have been. Her description of how this affected her was so relatable. And it's interesting that where she ended up is so different than most of the deconstructors that I've known. I mean, but it's when she gets to the points where she's talking like this, where when I really ask myself, who is this book really for? Because I, I get who she thinks it's for. Like she, she thinks it's for the people who are uh, 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 deconstructing or thinking about deconstructing or have done deconstructing. Like that's who she thinks it's for. But those people, I, I, I don't know if those people would actually re- like if you had deconstructed and you weren't doing a podcast about this book, would you have taken the time to read Ginger's book? Absolutely not. Honestly, I think that like I really think that like 90 percent of her book sales are going to be from people who want celebrity gossip and the people who are into the people who are into, you know, seeing Ginger on the cover of People magazine at the checkout counter. And and those people are going to put this book down after 50 pages after they realize that this legit isn't a tell all and that she's like all she's doing is talking about trusting Jesus in the most generic and like condescending way possible for like 240 pages and then just quoting Bible verses. So I do notice on the topic of who this book is for. She often explains biblical or Christian concepts as if she were writing to people who are not Christian and have little familiarity with Christianity. For example, on page 50, she gives a definition of what communion is in a Christian church. And then a few pages later, she has she feels that she needs to explain who Job is. The quote is, Job is an Old Testament man who lost his wealth, friends, health, and children. So that's a that's a very basic, you know, Bible 101 explanation. So it kind of seems like she is expecting a lot of non-believers to read this. Yeah. So put a pin in this because we're going to come to come back to this at, at, at some point at the end of the episode. But I think it's interesting because like I'm familiar with with these religious stories because I'm Jewish. I'm not a Christian and I read this book and there's if, if you had to give me a book and tell me to read this and you're uh, trying to like almost like inoculate me from Christianity, this would be a perfect book to inoculate me from Christianity with. Let's go take up the offering while we're here. And when we come back, we'll continue going through the Gothard principles and how Ginger disentangled them (laughs) and what her conclusions were. G'day, I'm Troy. And I'm Brian. And we're the hosts of I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist, an ex-evangelical podcast. We used to be loyal members and leaders in Australian Christian megachurches, but we're not anymore. I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist is an honest and hilarious peek behind the curtain at the weird, the worrying, and sometimes traumatic world of evangelicals and Pentecostals. We share our stories, we interview prominent guests in the global ex-evangelical space, and provide a platform for others to tell their stories about their time in evangelicalism, and their journey out. Shortlisted at the recent Australian Podcast Awards, I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist gives you a unique global perspective into one of the fastest growing religions in the world from the people who actually lived it. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and IWasAteenageFundamentalist.com. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. We are back from our break. Thank you guys all for listening. Um, I just want to take this time before we get into the second half of our episode to let you guys know what we have coming out next week. Uh, We have a Valentine's Day special episode where we will be going into Fundy Sex 
influencers. That's right. We're really excited for Fundy Sex Influencers. So we're going to be talking purity culture. We're going to be talking Paul and Morgan. We're going to be talking Girl Defined. And best yet, we've got our friend, um, a, a friend of Sadie's and mine, who is a real uh, a practicing sex therapist in the state of New York. And she's going to come on and she's going to tell us what she thinks of what some of these fundy sex influencers have to say. So make sure that you guys tune in for that one. Make sure that you guys subscribe so that you get that one right on Monday. And if you're a patron, there will also be a traditional Valentine's Day special patrons only episode coming out this week as well yeah that's true guys last year you guys remember the people that made uh they, they did the fundy sex playlist cd mm-hmm. which was all like elevator music and like ocean sounds <laughs> and i referenced in that episode that these people had also written a book and that i knew about the book but didn't have a copy well now i have i have acquired a copy and uh we are going to go into that in detail on the Patreon for your Valentine's Day thank you gift from us. Yeah, so make sure that you're subscribed to the Patreon so that you get access to that one as well, as well as the extended version of today's episode and the extended version of uh, next week's episode. Uh, We've already started work on both of those episodes, and I'll just let you know that they are absolutely, they're going to be a lot of fun. I'm I'm really excited for them. But I want to pivot back to Ginger Duggar Vuolo's book, Becoming Free Indeed, I want to talk real quick about what she says about the health and wealth gospel, otherwise known as prosperity gospel. Yeah, this is another one of those phrases, health and wealth gospel. She starts using this phrase and then she uses it a lot throughout the rest of the book. She does make a really great point about how she was taught to reject the prosperity gospel of like Joel Osteen, mega church televangelists, like those people, the name it and claim it people, the people who would say, oh, well, if you send me money, then God will give it back to you. She was, I think, rightly taught to reject that. And she now recognizes that the IBLP is just another version of that same teaching. The Gothard version is follow the rules and you will be blessed with financial stability and a perfect life. So she has got all of those pieces put together really well in her mind. What she fails to do is consider on paper in this book whether she might still be practicing a third different version of what she calls the health and wealth gospel. Right, because she is a Calvinist now. She believes essentially in determinism and that whether or not you are healthy and whether or not you are wealthy is something that is decided by God. Right. So she she goes into so much detail about the thought process that led her to reject the IBLP and I think she she does a really great job of that. The thought process that she went through is very similar to what most people who have deconstructed from the IBLP went through. What she doesn't tell us is whether she applied that to her new beliefs and found them adequate or whether she never bothered to apply that thought process to her new beliefs. That it's just it's a hole in her presentation of her beliefs in this book. We we just don't know whether or not she did that. Another thing she talks about a lot in these middle chapters is how much she judged other people who didn't follow the IBLP. Here's a quote on that. My teenage self would see other people suffering, sorry, my teenage self would see other young people suffering or struggling spiritually and assume their pain was a result of some rebellion against their parents. She hmm. knows that that was incorrect. And she implies that she no longer judges along those lines. Along those lines. What she she doesn't do is say, I really regret judging people like that. Or, man, I was really wrong. It's, It's an oversight, in my opinion, not to make a clear statement of I am sorry. She does express regret in clear terms about one thing from this time period. I'm talking about a a passage in the beginning of chapter 5. Ginger says that she regrets using her time in prison ministry to take prisoners through the Journey to the Heart, which is an IBLP program. She says, quote, It was borderline silly for someone like me to talk to prisoners about decisions they could make that would improve their circumstances. Yes, it was. (laughs) Almost self-aware. Well, Just- that that sentence is fine. It's the next sentence that I have an issue with. Quote, 
Instead, I wish I'd taken those opportunities to tell the inmates how they could truly be free even while they were in prison. Uh, I wish I had talked about the radical love of Jesus Christ. Ah. Uh, mm. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be able to sell, to to sew this up for you in better words when we get to the end of this book review. But the issue the issue isn't that she found peace and something that feels freeing in Jesus or in her even in her current faith practice. The issue is that she went from one thing where something is the only answer to another thing where something is the one and only answer. I tell you, Sadie, this section of the book. And there was another section a little bit later. I think it was chapter eight. Um, but th- th- this section in particular made me want to attach a shop vac to both of my ears and suck my brains out. It was, just, uh. <laughs> it was just like, it's like rage bait almost is, 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 is how I would almost describe this book. But not quite. Not uh. quite. So I want to point out one thing from this section. One other thing. So she is talking about uh, Ben Seawald, her brother-in-law, and her future husband, Jeremy, introducing her to a new way of looking at the Bible. Like I said earlier, it seems like what happened was she was introduced to a new type of theology for the first time in her entire life. And the theology she was raised with had caused her so much harm that she knew that wasn't it. So when this new thing came along that seemed much less harmful and I would categorize as less harmful, she just jumped onto the new train. One really good point she makes in this section is that Gothard would choose one verse or one phrase in a verse and make that an entire teaching and expound on it and build off of it until he was truly extra biblical. And when Ben Seawald talked to her about scripture, he would quote a whole passage and that the Seawald family introduced her to reading scripture in context for the first time. I still disagree with the conclusions that these Seawalds and Jeremy are drawing from the context of scripture, but I thought this was really interesting that she didn't feel that she had been introduced to reading scripture in context before. Chapter 6 and I may get dragged on the snarker forums for saying this, but chapter six made me hate Jeremy a little bit less. It seems like he was very compassionate. According to Ginger, he listened to 60 hours of Gothard content before they started courting. He wanted to understand what Gothard had to say. He made copious notes of things that he disagreed with, and then he listened through the Gothard tapes with Ginger and talked her through the things that he didn't agree with. If this is an accurate portrayal, It would make me hate Jeremy a lot less. She told a story from this time frame where she and Jeremy were recording about listening to a Gothard tape with him, where Gothard tells a story about a woman who had a picture of a sailing ship on her wall in her home. When this woman's husband and children were killed at sea, a pastor blamed her for having that image on her wall because she had unknowingly influenced their fate. And Gothard agreed with the pastor in this story that this woman was to blame. He used it as an illustration of how any object that is in a home can potentially influence your family or cause destruction. Ginger said that this story was a way that Jeremy pointed out to her how the IBLP is based on superstition. And she realized that how many of their rules are pure superstition. So that's another thing that I absolutely agree with her uh, about the IBLP. Do you think that... um because Jeremy was friends with Ben Seawald before uh, uh, he and Ginger started going out right. or, or they started courting. Do you think that possibly Ben and Jessa conspired with Jeremy as her as as him marrying Ginger as a way to break her out? I wouldn't say it's impossible. Because that's the thing. Because this guy went and listened to 60 hours of IBLP bill gothard tapes i think some of that was jim bob made him because jim bob was nervous about his daughter marrying a calvinist but now that we know that ben seawald's theology is very similar to jeremy's that kind of doesn't track unless ben seawald maybe didn't tell jim bob (laughs) yeah or maybe ben seawald i i don't i this i mean this is literally just like theories and, and spitballing um I I don't know. It's it's possible that Jeremy turned on the the Bill Gothard tapes and said, "This sh- 
was crazy. I need to rescue this woman. <laughs> and that's why, like, because he, it, it took him months and months and months to get Jim Bob's approval. Yeah. To, to, to enter into a courtship with his daughter. I mean, that's, that takes some determination. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you're going to go on a rescue mission like that for somebody that you don't really care about. Yeah. I, I know. It's, I mean, it's just wild to think about. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a theory. I don't, I don't know if is, I believe it or not. I'm just, and it's it like, out it's there. extra wild, I think, to those of us who grew up in a similar group to this because we understand how big of a deal that is. I can't, you know, thinking back almost 15 years ago (laughs) when I was starting to come up on IFB marriage age and having boys interested in me and people asking my dad if we could date or if we could go into a courtship, I can't imagine him ever letting me court or date a Calvinist. Just thinking his mindset at the time and my mindset at the time. And you wouldn't have wanted to. Or you would have been like, okay, let me try to date this Calvinist, but then I'll try to pull him into the IFB way of thinking. Right. <laughs> so it, I, I know that the IBLP is a different dynamic than the plain old IFB that I grew up in. So there's probably a few pieces of context that I'm missing here. But comparing it to my own experience is a little bit of a, a mind-blowing experience there. <laughs> I mean, because Calvinism, I, I know that they're they're all based on the Bible and they're all based on Christianity, but Calvinism is almost a different religion entirely from... Right. So it it is, um, if you want all the details, of course, we just did an episode about this. I think it was episode 117. Um, it, it came out like two weeks ago. Yeah. But every everybody agrees that the, um, all of these groups agree. Jesus died to save people and you trust him and that's what gets you to go to heaven. It, but everything else about like why specifically did he die? What effect specifically did his death have that changes people's eternal destiny from heaven to hell uh, or hell to heaven? How does a person access whatever change Jesus's death affected? It, it is all of that is they disagree on. So let's uh, let's move through to chapter seven. I don't have a lot of notes from that chapter, but in chapter seven, Ginger talks about Gothard pressuring the audience at seminars to make vows to God. And this is something I haven't heard as much about from the IBLP, probably because everybody's traumatized from it. But he would have people make a solemn vow before God to never drink alcohol or to dress modestly or to read their Bible and pray daily, whatever it was that he was harping on that particular seminar. Then, After people had made the vow, Gothard would tell people that God might kill or harm them if they broke their vow. This is a form of manipulation that I have absolutely experienced myself. This really sucks to go through. And deconstructing, if you're going through your deconstructing and you're thinking, well, I when I was 16 in church service, I made a promise that I would never go out in public wearing pants and now I'm going out in public wearing pants Mm -hmm. and I said may God strike me down if I ever go out in public wearing pants and now I'm doing that am I still held to that Mm -hmm. and what's for anybody who has been through that what's helped me is uh, remembering that people who are under 18 cannot sign contracts legally do you want to tell the story about how you signed the agreement to go on a missions trip Yeah. So short version, I was at pastor school in 2005 or 2006. And the climax of the cry night last night of pastor school service was that convicted felon Jack Scott asked, who was not a convicted felon yet at the time, long story, asked people to sign a two-year contract to serve a two-year mission on the mission field. His point was, the Mormons do this. Why are we not as committed as the Mormons? So I signed a contract. I would have been, if it was in 2005, I would have just turned 12, which seems unbelievable. And if it was in 2006, I would have just turned 13, which still seems a little unbelievable. But I was convinced that this was the thing that I needed to do. They were playing a sad song about children burning in hell. I remember standing there just tears streaming down my face, and I signed this contract. Well, seven years later after that, roughly, 
I was in early deconstruction. I was thinking about leaving the IFB, and I seriously considered whether I owed it to God to go be a missionary for two years before leaving the IFB. <laughs> I already, really? yeah, I already wanted out, but I, I really thought that since I had given my word, this was something that I had to do. And as I matured a little bit beyond that, I realized that a twelve-year-old or a thirteen-year-old cannot <laughs> legally promise anything like that. And and I don't think that a just God would expect that of a 12-year-old who is being subjected to extreme emotional manipulation. But this sort of thing, this is really common in these mm -hmm. kind of fundamentalist circles is they will get young children. And it's the same sort of thing with the age of accountability mm -hmm. where they'll say, oh, well, my seven-year-old has said, I want to I want to be saved by Jesus and go to heaven, or their six-year-old or their five-year-old or their four-year-old. Right. Um, so this is, this is, a, it's a really common manipulation tactic, and I feel bad for anybody who went through it. So not only did Gothard have people take these solemn vows that they would do a certain thing, and usually they were lifelong vows, he also, he saw the Bible as a divine rule book, and Ginger's perception is that he didn't see the Bible as much more than a rule book. Everything was meant to be interpreted as a practical rule for life, a new rule added on to an already endless list of rules. Ginger talks a lot about rimas in this section. A rima is a personalized message from God to you, an IBLP believer, and you take this message from the Bible and you make it into a new rule for your life. So, you might be reading a specific verse and you feel like God is pointing out the number 27 in this verse, and you believe that God just gave you a rima that you were supposed to read your Bible and pray for 27 minutes a day minimum. And it's not, it doesn't make it a sin for other people not to fulfill that requirement, but it's like a special rule from God just for you. So, that was, that was an interesting, um, definition and application of rimas, for sure. If you want a much better definition, by the way, of this and all other things IBLP, I would recommend the book Lovingly Abused by Heather Heath. She has been on our show. She is friend of the pod. By all means, check her book out. It's also much better written than Ginger's. So <laughs> if you'd like a working definition of a lot of the terms, that's where you can find it. I mean, there's a lot of things that are better written than Ginger's book. I've read TV guide magazines that are better written than Ginger's book. I've read um, instruction manuals for computers that were translated from another language that were better written than Ginger's book. That is. So I guess I should just say that Heather's <laughs> book is extraordinarily well written and captivating. <laughs> Do you want to move on to chapter eight now? Because Absolutely. Chapter eight, I think this might be the chapter where we have we like have to spend the most time because this yeah. is where like this is where Ginger really piles it on as far as religion, as far as as her whatever her theology says is. This is where we get the real insight to actually criticize what Ginger's theological beliefs are and 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 why I think we're being so hard on her. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want me to read this quote or do you want to read this quote? Um, that, that uh, go ahead, to... I'll I'll let you do that. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is a quote from chapter eight of, of her book, and it's, uh, it says, Jesus' death on the cross freed me from the consequences of sin. I don't ever have to worry that God will punish me for my mistakes and disobedience, past, present, or future, because I don't have to face the wrath of God. I can enjoy freedom from all other fears. Why worry about what others think of me if God loves me as my father? Why worry that I won't have what I need if God controls everything and has promised to provide for me as his child? And here, here's the truly crazy part. Why worry about what will happen in the future if God has promised that one day I will live forever with him in heaven? <sighs> that when I heard that, I had to go back and, and listen to that again to make sure I heard it right. I think what she's trying to say is that she tries to not live in a constant anxiety spiral because she believes that God will fix it in the end. But how this comes off is, I don't worry about anything. 
I don't ever have a negative thought because I'm going to go to heaven. <laughs> you, you know, gender bad happens between now and heaven. You know that, right? I mean, like, but then she goes on, like, almost right after this part to to describe an IBLP family with too many kids and not enough money and how difficult that can be. And I'm like, do you do you not understand that what what you said here is you you said God will provide me what I need, and then you have this IBLP family. What is God not providing them with it? Do they not love Jesus enough for God to provide them with what they need? So she gets this correct uh, in her description of this IBLP family. I really appreciated that she made it clear that it's not a hypothetical, that this is a very real thing that has happened to people that she personally knew, that they followed IBLP teachings, they kept on getting pregnant, they were, had more kids than they could afford, they had more kids than they had space for, and they were just kind of walking around going, well, God will provide. She, I think she somewhat implies that because they were not living in true freedom and they were following the wrong version of Jesus is why God didn't provide for them. She also sees God's provision as something that's a little more spiritual and less physical. So when she talks about God will provide for her life, she's not saying, oh, God will magically pay my bills so that I can have 14 kids. She's saying, oh, God will take care of me even if I'm poor or even if I'm sick or even if something bad happens to me, which on one hand, I appreciate. On the other hand, why worry about anything because I'm going to heaven is a pretty reductive take. Yeah. And also Ginger has been on, she, I mean, she's been on reality TV since she was like, what, 10 years old? Yeah. So her entire adult life, she's been basically a reality tv star and she's never had to actually have a real job right and i think we can see from this book i don't mean to demean her and say that she's never been through anything difficult because we can see through this from this book that she has she's gone through very real emotional difficulties uh, and i don't and especially um everything with her older brother sex pest dugger that must have been incredibly difficult and i don't mean to say that she's never been through anything I do feel that perhaps she has never been through significant financial woes. So it's a little easier to say God will provide for everything when you're leaning on God for emotional support and not food for your children. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. There's like, cause I mean, you grew up food insecure. Yeah. And what did your family not trust God enough? Did your family not trust Jesus enough? That's the implication of what you're saying. So, okay, so people people who are insecure, in food, in food insecure in fundamentalism, how this works is you are figuring out a way to feed your kids something. You are very concerned because you've got five days till payday and you've only got three days worth of food. You stretch the food. You do everything you can. You add rice and water to everything. And it's getting really tight and it's just about to be a disaster. And then something good happens. You know, you find a $20 bill on the sidewalk, or um, the church takes up a love offering for you, or a church member stops by with a little bit of food, and that's enough to get you through those two extra days until payday. And then you say that God provides. Oh, God put that $20 bill on the sidewalk for me, or God told my church member to come by with all the leftover cans of pumpkin from Thanksgiving that they didn't get around to baking with. And what these people tend to not realize is that windfalls happen to non-Christian poor people too. It, so they they just, you know, non-Christian poor people find a $20 bill on the sidewalk just in time to feed their kids sometimes or have a friend or family member stop by with food sometimes. And they interpret it as God's provision when, in my opinion, it's likely random chance. Or it could just be the good of other people and and people right or human goodness. Community. Yeah, um, man, uh, just I mean, but but then she goes on to say, this is a quote from her. She says, "Jesus is the source of true freedom." But and her definition of freedom is seems to be less anxiety and looser rules. Yeah, and that's not really helpful if your family can't feed itself from having too many kids, and you just have to like trust Jesus. Like this passage. I feel like this passage is the theological equivalent of leaving a gospel tract instead of tipping your waiter at brunch after church. Mm -hmm. That's um, can, can I go in and read on uh, uh, the next quote? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the next quote that I have from her is 
Someone under a man-made religious system can never break free from the demands of that system. You know what, Ginger? That's very. That's like a very uh, a salient point. I'm glad that you said that. And then she goes on to say, however, on top of that, man-made religious systems cannot take care of our biggest problem, sin. Contrary to what I grew up believing, the ultimate threat to you and me is not the world. Instead, the ultimate threat to me is me. I need freedom, not from the influence of the world, not even from a religious system, but from myself. (laughs) You don't see how freedom from yourself is going to feed your family. Either. No, the, like the the thing that she seems to be doing here, she like, and this is what I said up at the top. IBLP is a man-made religion and is not the true Christianity. Therefore, the thing that you have been harmed by is not Christianity, but the IBLP and Bill Gothard. Therefore, you have no reason or justification to leave Christianity if you've been harmed by the IBLP and Gil- and Bill Gothard. Yep. That's the argument that she's making here. Aside from the part where she says, I need freedom from myself. I need freedom from having to make decisions. Like, what she is essentially doing here is employing a no true Scotsman fallacy and then using it that to, like, I, I don't know if it's, do you think it's intentionally or unintentionally, but she's definitely gaslighting here. I think it's unintentional because I think she believes this. Fortunately, I don't think she's doing a very good job of it. And I think that the people who she's talking to in this book have a lot of them have already done like the really hard and grueling work of deconstruction and determining what freedom means to them. And I think most of the time freedom to these people, it does not mean trusting Jesus more, Mm -hmm. you know? And so they're going to read something like this and see it for, you know, the bullshit that it is. I don't ever want to, to look down on people who, deconstructed and found peace in some form of Christianity as long as it is a non-harmful and an actively non-harmful way, form of Christianity, and they are working to continue to keep it actively non-harmful. That's an important part. I mean, that's your story. Although <laughs> a significant number of Christians will tell me that I'm not a true Christian for a significant multitude of reasons. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons. Uh Sometimes I feel like I'm the believer that most believers don't like at all. Well, then that means that you're the believer Jesus loves the most. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't need to be the one that Jesus loves the most. I just need my nightmares of finding out that I was wrong to not come true. So, the I the, the, the IBLP said they have the only correct answer on how to live life. And Ginger says that this is not true Christianity. Unfortunately, that's where she's correct. That is one form, one way of practicing Christianity. I can sit here, she can sit here and say that we think they've got it wrong all day. And that's a valid statement. But those people are practicing Christianity. You can't just say that whatever thing you practice is the true Christianity. That is textbook, no true Scotsman fallacy. So Ginger believes that what she defines as true Christianity is now the thing that has the only one correct answer on how to live life. And she's so close to self-awareness because she recognizes that the IBLP did not have the answer. And she criticizes a system that says it has the only true answer. But then she accepts that her current system of belief has the true answer. And she doesn't, again, like I said right after the break, She does not tell us on paper how or why she came to the conclusion that this particular faith practice and system of belief has the only one true correct answer. And she doesn't tell us what that consideration process was like, because she could have gone through a very long practice of scriptural study and listening to a lot of different resources and listening to a lot of different opinions and coming to the conclusion that this is the one that works for her. Or she could have just heard about this one time and say, yep, that's it. That's for me. And she does not inform us what kind, what her thinking process was on this. Or she could have married a guy who said, this is the true way that it actually is. And she said, wow, this is much more freeing than what I'm used to. I pick this one. 
Right. And I don't want to make an assumption on which one of those things she did, even though in my heart I feel like it's the latter. I don't want to just accuse her of doing that. I wish she had told us. Well, the next thing that Ginger goes on to say is she says, I am born enslaved by my own sin. Yep, Which, total depravity. Total depravity. Uh, that's the P in, 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 in tulip in Calvinism. It's the um, T. Oh, the T? P is perseverance of the saints. I can't spell. That's what's wrong with me. <laughs> no, because in, in Ginger's mind, the worst thing that can happen to somebody is that they decide to leave the church and no longer be a Christian. It does like it does not matter what happens to somebody in their life. Like it doesn't matter if they are molested. It doesn't matter if they're abused as part of the IBLP. It doesn't matter if they're disowned by their parents. Like like say you're you're an LGBTQ person and you get disowned by your parents. Uh, and you grew up in the IBLP and that's something awful that happens to you. Mm -hmm. All of those things to her pale in comparison to the horrible tragedy of somebody no longer identifying as a Christian. This is just like... And that is because of the reformed slash Calvinist doctrine of perseverance of the saints. That's the P in in, in That's in tulip. the P in Tulip. Yeah. Because uh, under that doctrine, if you turn away from God... That means that you were never a true Christian to begin with and therefore are going to hell. That's yeah. why it's such a big deal to her and feels like such a tragedy to her. Yeah. And the, the like the thing with this is, you know, because I've talked to you about this, these subjects for so long about this, this deconstruction and all the things that you went through, especially um, you being a pastor's kid and the, the immense pressure that was on you. And she discusses many of the same experiences as you except that she was on reality tv so her fishbowl was was much bigger and so many of the paragraphs like from this book i feel like are paragraphs that could have come out of your mouth like on this podcast and then she'll just flip it or do like a full 180 and say well and then i learned to trust jesus properly and learned what christianity truly is and it's just like uh <laughs> come on ah uh. She does talk a lot in this chapter in the next couple about what it was like being a pastor's child or being a pastor's wife after she married Jeremy. I think the anxiety of that was really compounded for her, not only by the fact that she was on reality TV, but also by the fact that she had mostly attended house churches growing up. So she did not have what she called a script for how a good pastor's wife was supposed to be. I thought it was so interesting that she used the word script to describe the IF, or IBLP prescribed way of dress, way of acting, way of relating to other people, because that's certainly a term that I've used before. But between that strict script that she grew up with and being one of 19 children, she felt like she had no identity or personality outside of that. So when she became a young pastor's wife to Jeremy while he was pastoring in Laredo, Texas, she was in a situation where she was supposed to be a whole person with a personality and a life, and she had no clue how to do that. Extremely relatable to all of the exes out there. Yep. <laughs> And that's why I'm saying that all of this stuff that she was saying, I'm like, man, that could have come out of Sadie's mouth. Yeah, someone actually, com so before I had read this book, I saw a comment online where somebody says, wow, this really sounds like Sadie. And then I read the book and I thought, oh, wow, no, they were right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I think you're way cooler than Ginger Duggar. Thank you. <laughs> Ginger Duggar would never dye her hair aquamarine. That, uh, she's Breaking not cool news. Enough. Gabrielle <laughs> leaves me to start a new podcast with Ginger Duggar. <laughs> oh, God. Kill me now. Uh, no. Um, but is she the thing that she does describe uh, that was she describes Jeremy encouraging her to be herself like she she acknowledges that she's having these problems and jeremy encourages her to be herself and not perform positivity which i mean bare minimum but still yeah that big if true i i have to say uh this this book got jeremy some points <laughs> not saying that i love him now or anything but he did he did come off very nicely in this book 
she she talks about the the ministry that uh that that Jeremy has in LA and and Grace Church and and the ministry that he's part of. Oh yeah, and, the, the passage with all the dog whistles in it. Yeah, mm-hmm. so let's let's talk about these dog whistles. So, um cuz this part it starts to play almost as like an infomercial for Jeremy's ministry. Uh it's it's Grace Church, right? Right. So Jeremy is in seminary. Um in, in the seminary is called the Master's Seminary. It is run by John MacArthur. I wish you could. I I made a, a a face of disgust. I know that doesn't come over radio, but you can imagine it. Maybe we should do an episode about John MacArthur at some point in the future. He makes me so mad. He just makes me so mad. Part this part of the book really seemed to play almost as if Ginger was trying to give an infomercial mm-hmm. for, for for this ministry for for Grace Church. Like in much of the same way. Do you remember when we were reading Dating with a Purpose and yes. Healing for the Inner Hurt? Mm-hmm. Uh, which are are respectively a dating manual and a mental health book, both of which were written by uh, uh, Pastor Jack Scop, who is a convicted pedophile and sex trafficker who currently is released from prison a year early. Um, we're not sure why he got released from prison early, but he's a convicted uh, pedophile and he wrote these books and he would be talking about some serious problem. And, like he would be talking about like, a teen suicide rates or something. And then he would pivot immediately to saying that isn't a problem at all at Hiles Anderson college where we have a beautiful lake and amenities for all of our X number of students who choose to go here to to learn how to preach the light of the Lord. Like, (laughs) right. (laughs) But that's how this passage played to me. Mm -hmm. So there was a very telling quote, I thought from this passage about grace church, She's talking about how she has friends and fellow church members in LA who have nose rings and tattoos. And some people wear conservative dresses and suits to church, but some people wear jeans. And the church has a hymns only service and it also has a worship music service. And her her point is supposed to be that there are a diversity of viewpoints and ways of connecting with God in this group of people that go to Grace Church. But then she says, quote, And the people of our church submit to everything the Bible teaches, even if that puts them out of step with the broader culture. So, Sadie, do you want to dissect what that actually means? What is she actually saying there? Uh, I fully assume that this is referencing primarily John MacArthur's pretty blatant and disgusting homophobia, as well as his misogyny. I pulled an article by him called God's Plan for the Gay Agenda. I could have read any two sentences out of this article to make you mad, but I want to stick with the sentences that encapsulate the article in the interest of intellectual fairness. Those two sentences read, So, What is God's response to the homosexual agenda? Certain and final judgment. Boo. Yep. Yep. Uh, That whole article is um, awful and read at your own risk. Please don't read things just to hurt your own feelings or to make yourself mad. If you read something that's awful and homophobic like that, if it if it's going to make you go out and fight for what you believe is right, if it's going to encourage you to be a good ally, by all means, if it's just going to hurt your feelings, maybe don't do that. These people write these articles and so because they specifically want the smoke. They want to get into big fights with people and show that they're you know, being mm-hmm. very loudly reactionary. So if you want to go and take it to him on Twitter, he's expecting that. And that's why he wrote it. Right. Yeah. So only, I always advise people, again, I'm not going to tell people don't engage with this at all because that's not the right answer for everybody. But what I always want to do is is caution people to only engage if it's going to be productive in some way for you, for other people, for someone. So Ginger says that her current pastors preach simply what the Bible says, without anecdotes, jokes, or opinion. And that sounds great, but I really think it's a dog whistle. And I really believe that what she means is, we're modern and we don't prohibit jeans or light drinking or PG movies, but we hold on tight to complementarianism and homophobia. This was my favorite part of the book, okay? Um, I think you you oh, yes. know what my favorite part of the book was. She goes right from saying 
my current pastors simply preach what the Bible says to turning like almost the next, like very quickly after that saying, the Bible doesn't tell you whether to order beef or chicken or pork. <laughs> yes, Ginger. Yes, it does tell you. It yes, absolutely <laughs> She's talking about how the Duggars, led by Bill Gothard, refrained from eating pork or certain seafood when she was growing up. They did not keep kosher, as is evidenced by tater tot casserole's existence, um, but they they did not eat some of the meats that were considered unclean in the Old Testament. And her point is that the Old Testament, things like dietary laws were abolished by Jesus' death on the cross, and Christians are not obligated to keep them, which is pretty typical Christian theology. But she, but she believes that other parts of the Old Testament still apply in full to Christians, and she's not doing any better than anyone else at making any kind of clear division on what is what. Yeah, I mean, she she said something about the uh the, the ceremonial law or something like right. like that's she she referred to some things as ceremonial law and some things as like civil law and some things as like uh, uh moral law moral yeah like she it it really does feel like a pick and choose situation right there but like when she literally says the Bible doesn't tell you whether or not you should eat pork I'm like yes it literally does tell you that in the Bible. <laughs> Yeah. Like in you may not you may think that there's like an exception to that rule because like but the Bible literally does say don't do this. And that's not neither here nor there and I'm not telling people oh you can't eat pork because the Bible says you can't eat pork but like you can't go around saying I'm doing exactly what the Bible says and then say the Bi like and then say that the Bible says something that it doesn't say or doesn't say something that it does. Uh, right. My god. Um so can we, can we get to the part where where she's talking about disentanglement because there's yeah, there's let's go and also I'm sorry I can't use the word entanglement without thinking of Will Smith uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry uh, but but disentanglement and this is the part of the book where she really like gets into talking about it disentanglement is offered as an alternative to deconstruction. And all it really is is going through the teachings that you were raised with and figuring out what is or isn't an actual commandment from the Bible. So the reason why Ginger is pushing this, it seems to me, is that it can be done without the prerequisite of asking, do I still want religion in my life? Do I still want Christianity in my life? Because like I said earlier, in Ginger's mind, the worst thing that can happen to somebody is that in their life, worse than anything else that can ever happen to anybody in their life is them not accepting Jesus or saying that they don't want to be a Christian anymore. So she doesn't even want them asking that question mm -hmm. to begin with. So she's trying to present an easier alternative that doesn't have the same amount of emotional turmoil or and like crisis of identity. And I understand why this would be attractive to some people, but it feels like to me that she is almost like bargaining, you know what I'm saying? She's bargaining mm -hmm. with potential deconstructors over what deconstruction looks like to them and banking on the possibility that they have not internalized the realization that, you know, they themselves and, and like they alone get to determine what religion and spirituality look like in their own future. So she's offering this as like a middle ground in a negotiation that like not only she has no stakes in, but she also has no leverage in. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm very weird. Yeah. Well, there's a quote that I wrote down um, from chapter 14. I'm going to skip down to that. Give me a minute. See if I can find it. Yeah. I mean, unless of course, like the people she's bargaining with aren't the people who are reading this book and she's trying to bargain with somebody else entirely, uh, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read you this whole quote later, but she she characterizes deconstruction as the process of building your life around your own desires and wants outside of Christianity. So when she's bargaining with deconstructors, what she's trying to offer is look, you can have a lot of your desires. Now, if what you desire is extramarital sex, you can't have that. If you, if what you 
quote unquote desire is to be gay or trans. No, you can't have that. But if what you desire is just wearing jeans, you can have it. If what you desire is just eating pork, you can have it. If what you desire is worship music here, you can have that too. So she's bargaining and offering all of these freedoms that she believes she has, as well as the entire package that she calls Christian liberty, freedom in Christ, a new feeling of freedom not encumbered by the thousands and thousands of Gothard rules. And she thinks she's got something so great that if she just tells people about it, they won't feel the need to go through those deep, dark hours of soul-searching of what the f*** do I believe about God? And what does my, the in the core of my being, do I believe or do I not believe? Can I read another quote here? Yeah, please. Because I, I, th- I think that I, I've, I have another quote that's very relevant to what you just said. Um, so here's a quote from where she says, rules are easier than liberty. They give a sense of certainty. They remove doubts and questions. Knowing what to do and what to say in any situation is it, to perfectly please God is an incredibly attractive idea. It certainly was for me, since I was struggling with doubt and fear, Gothard gave me rules and, and certainty. And she she basically shift gears from here and she's talking about Bill Gothard. Um, I wrote down this exact same quote. And for all the things that I am disappointed in in this book, I am truly happy that she has come to this conclusion. This is one of a few things that she gets absolutely right. The appeal of having lots of rules, the appeal of the IBLP, and why specifically it's so hard to leave it. That that uh, concept, she's got nailed down. Right. But I want to take this quote and combine it with the quote from chapter one where she says, I am not the best judge of what is best for me. Because mm-hmm. Ginger, you can't have it both ways. It's like it's so ironic to me that she says rules are easier than liberty. But then later in the book, she says that people who deconstruct are the ones who take the easy way out. Right. God. So there's there's a huge part of me that wants to have all of the sympathy for her here. I am expounding on what she actually wrote. So I'm letting you know up front that I'm reading into the text here. But I feel that throughout this book, she's been describing having a feeling of no sense of self when she was growing up. I don't think that's too much of an extrapolation. So now she has some sense of self and some agency. And I think what she's saying is that to her, that feels like everything she needs. I think that so many people who deconstructed went through this phase. A lot of us kind of cycled through less strict and less oppressive forms of Christianity on the way to a final destination, somewhere on the progressive side of Christianity. And then a lot of people did that cycle a couple of times and came to the conclusion that what they truly believe is, is that they are an agnostic or an atheist. It's a lot fewer people who I have seen go from oppressive religion and jump straight to atheism or agnosticism, it's my opinion that those people tended to have been doing that deconstruction quietly for a very long time and experimenting with those ideas inside themselves for a long time before breaking out. We have this interesting perspective on the show because we want to be a place that affirms and validates both believers and non-believers. I feel like I say this over and over and over. If you're coming out of a group that is toxic and oppressive You do not owe anyone to arrive at their preferred destination, whether their preferred destination is more modern evangelicalism like Ginger or extremely progressive Christian like me or some other form of spirituality or atheism. The only invalid final destination at the end of deconstruction is retaining views that are actively harmful. So quick tr- trigger warning about, I'm um, talk about abortion real quick, nothing graphic. But in my opinion, if someone is deconstructing and they are really dealing with everything that they were taught about abortion and they land in a different place than me, their destination is believing that a fetus is a human being, but that human being's rights don't trump the rights of the pregnant person, this hypothetical person feels like they could never justify having an abortion themselves for any reason, but they understand that 
laws that try to prevent other people from having abortions are not effective and just harm more people. And so they won't vote to prevent other people from having abortion access. And that's a pretty common viewpoint that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. that, that's not my viewpoint. But th it's not okay for me to say that a person who holds that viewpoint has not fully deconstructed or is not really deconstructing. Because that is an actively non-harmful viewpoint. That hypothetical viewpoint that I just put together, and I do know a lot of people who hold that, goes out of its way to reduce the harm to other people. So the only time that I'll say someone isn't deconstructed or isn't really deconstructing is when their views are still actively harmful to others or seek to harm others. I get a lot of people saying that I have not fully deconstructed because I still believe in God, well, whoever or whatever they are. And I, I, st I have people tell me that I'm still in a cult because I believe in God, which is not <laughs> the definition of a cult at all. I really take issue with that. I, that really bugs me because first, I have never claimed to be done deconstructing. I know for a fact that I have undertaken a lifelong process and that my beliefs will continue to change as I grow and learn more. But also, I believe that I have tackled the toxic and actively harmful beliefs that I have now or had in the past that I'm aware of, and I'm fully committed to tackling toxic and actively harmful beliefs that I find hiding in the deep, dark corners of my psyche in the future. So I, that, and that's why I don't appreciate it when people say that I am still brainwashed because I have a belief in God or that I am still in a cult because I have a belief in God because I am doing the work of deconstructing by not passively dealing with those toxic or harmful beliefs as they become apparent to me, but actively seeking them out and actively working to change them. I think that was very poignant what you said about this being a lifelong process. But I want to contrast that with what Ginger says in this book about this being a theological memoir. You know, she's saying here, I'm done. This is where I'm staying. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, I've turned off my brain and I'm not interested in doing it anymore because I've found the right answer. So I want to be sympathetic and I want to give her all this grace because there was a time that I believed almost exactly what she does now. And I think that a lot of deconstructors would have gone through a time period where they would have agreed with almost everything she says in this book. But as you said, she's putting this into print in such a way as to say that I have arrived. I have found the answer and I'm not looking any further. And that's what I find really concerning, especially because, as I said earlier, this great pastor who leads her awesome new church, is loud and proud about his homophobia and his misogyny. John Piper, who she also quoted in this book, is a huge advocate of wives submitting in marriage, complementarianism, and he even said that wives have a duty to endure spousal abuse in order to turn their husbands back to God. Wow. She also did an interview with Ali Beth Stuckey for this episode. And if you don't know her, save yourself. She is a transphobic, anti-mask, anti-vax, DeSantis shilling conservative influencer. And that's definitely the kind of person I would call actively harmful on a couple of major fronts. I was really disappointed that Ginger would partner with her in any form. So by my own metric, this isn't something I can support. Not because Ginger still believes in Jesus. Not because she's saying that Jesus is the answer for her. That's fine. I can't support it because her views and the views of people that she supports and quotes and partners with are not passively toxic. They are not something that are only going to hurt the people who believe them. They are views that cause people to vote in ways that negatively affect and harm others. They are views that cause people to treat others as less than human. They are views that sometimes call, cause people to affect real-life harm on those around them. And since those are the factors that I use as a matter of principle to determine whether something is actively harmful, it's not the believing in Jesus. It's not the reading the Bible. I have one more, one more, like more of a laugher quote from this, from this chapter and we can move on. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> that was intense. I'll give you a funny. Um, <laughs> Ginger says, quote, Christians can't have different convictions about the Bible, God, or salvation. Really? Yep. I thought, what? <laughs> yeah, they can. 
<laughs> yep. Wait, is, is she saying that her whole family isn't Christian? It, I don't know. <laughs> what is she saying here? She she says you're not Christian if you don't believe exactly what John MacArthur and John Piper and and, and, and my husband and, and me husband. believe about the Bible, <laughs> God, and salvation. So she went from being from playing no true Scotsman about the IBLP to no true Scotsman about Christians. To yeah, yeah, that's that's about it. Yeah. Okay. So let's um move on to chapter eleven. Let's uh, do it. Where this is where she starts to talk about Bill Gothard. Uh, or, or just before chapter eleven, she says that that Bill Gothard is a false prophet. Is is one of the things that she says. But in chapter eleven, this is where she starts talking about. Say she, she like goes into detail about how uh, her sisters perceived Bill Gothard when they were growing up. They talk about the Gothard girls, and she mm-hmm. talked about how like even then when they were young, they had the impression that Gothard really liked blonde women. Um, who who were very petite in figure to come work for him at the IBLP office. And yeah. oh, that's just an odd quirk of, the, of a funny old man. He's so sweet. Right. And he likes pretty girls. So this answered a question that I had asked rhetorically a lot. So I knew that logically, surely most IBLP families were not aware that if you sent your teenage daughter to work for Bill Gothard at headquarters, he might sexually harass or sexually abuse your daughter. Surely most people were not aware of that. I have to think maybe the board of the IBLP was, and maybe certain staff members were, but the rank and file wouldn't have known that. The question that I had was, did the rank and file know that he purposely chose young, pretty, predominantly blonde young women to work for him? Did they know about that? And it's a little bit shocking to find out that they did, right down to the details of him seeking out blonde girls. So Ginger tells this story, the oldest Ducker girls were out shopping at a mall, they found a blonde wig, and they all tried it on and were joking about, oh look, I can be one of Gothard's girls now. In this class structure, young unmarried women are the last to know anything. They are the bottom of the food chain. And it was a little bit shocking to know that that group of people who would have been the last to know anything in the bottom of the food chain would be so familiar not only with the concept that Gothard picks particularly attractive young women to go work for him, that they would talk about it, but they are so familiar with this concept that it seemed like an appropriate joke. This is not a culture where you joke about your leaders like that, and for it to be that widespread, the information is that well known, was that was maybe the biggest bit of tea in this entire book for me. Then she go she goes on to say if the allegations are true, Gothard should be permanently disqualified from ministry. But she says if the allegations are true, and then she doesn't go on to say I think that they're true, but she goes on to say, well, so many people came forward that it's really hard to deny it at this point. Is is the yeah the sheer right? number is overwhelming, and I think the testimonies are really consistent. To me, it sounds like she's still struggling to accept this, even though she knows in her heart that it's true. I've been there. I've been there. That's tough. There's some of that element to it. I think that she's also trying to sound a bit more reluctant to say that she thinks it's true so that she won't quite so strongly anger friends and family members who are still in the IBLP. Right. And the whole way that she talks about the many, many, many allegations against Bill Gothard, it's still framed in this idea of like, oh, it's hypocrisy, it's sin. She does not paint him. I wouldn't say she paints him as a predator. She more paints him as a victim of his own humanity. Yeah, she talks about recovering grace. And she says that when recovering grace first like blew up, she thought that they were lying agents of Satan. Um, right. But now she she sees it differently, and and she just she gives that as an example of how you know in she was, how brainwashed she was, and she goes on to so this is what's interesting to me is there's one section where there's two places in this entire book where she talks about Josh, and this is one of them in in this almost like listicle type section of the book where she outlines three major problems with the IBLP view of sexuality. 
the first one, she says the IBLP have an unbiblical view of sex where sex is taboo and dangerous and embarrassing and there's a culture of shame. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Duh. I, I mean, everybody and their mother knew that Two, They have an unbiblical view of marriage, unhealthy treatment of women. Women should have no expectations from their husbands. Um, gratefulness is most important. No consequences for men's actions, and and responsibility is always on women for holding marriage together. That's accurate. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, she says that it has been hard for her to learn not to perform being upbeat and positive all the time, and it's been hard for her to learn to ask her husband for help around the house. The bar for this is so low. <laughs> And uh, I don't know whether Jeremy sweeps up cracker crumbs or not, like his convicted felon brother-in-law famously did. But whether or not he's what we worldlies would consider a decent husband, he's so much better than what Ginger was raised to expect because she was raised to expect absolutely nothing. She thinks he's amazing. I think this whole bit explains a lot about why she seems to worship the ground that he walks on. This uh, this passage made that make a lot more sense to me. This is one of the things that really bothers me, is that because Josh Duggar isn't the only Josh Duggar in the world. She could have just as easily ended up married to a guy like him rather than getting married to a Calvinist pastor who seems to treat her pretty decently. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I guess like that's an upgrade over the usual IBLP guys who would have like had her be a mother of five or six kids by now but right so i think this explains a lot about like i said why she seems almost worshipful of jeremy because to those of us on the outside there's a lot of reasons to think like uh, he's not that great but when she was raised with literally zero expectations and a predator for a brother she understands how much worse it could be for her and her little complementarian marriage where she does not have to pretend to be happy 100% of the time is a, is such a big step up from what she was raised to expect. I think she doesn't feel like she needs to think about if there's any other steps up from there. Yeah. And so can I go on to point three? Yeah, go ahead. Of the, yeah. So, so her third point is unbiblical legalism. She, the third reason why uh, the, the IBLP view of, of sexuality is wrong is because they have unbiblical legalism. Um, they're obsessed with outward appearances, with man-made rules. And then this is one of two places in the entire book where Ginger talks about Josh. Uh, can, can I read this? I, I have kind of a large block of text that I've copied down. Yeah, can, I, go ahead. can I read this? Okay. So this is what she says. She says, one of the hardest realities of my life is that my brother Josh displayed the same hypocrisy as Gothard. He used his platform and even his job at the Family Research Council to promote the same ideas Gothard taught. But while he looked the part in so many ways, the true Josh appears to be so much different. He was living a lie. Even though he claimed to be following Jesus, his actions gave no evidence of a true love for God. A heart changed by the gospel. Watching all the pain Josh's sin has caused not only shows me the danger of hypocrisy, but also reveals that external religion, a life of performance, has nothing to do with following Jesus. Though I haven't seen or spoken to Josh in nearly two years, I still pray for him. I asked God to show Josh his desperate need for repentance. I want my brother to be genuine and honest about his sin and reject the hypocrisy that has been a part of his life for so long. Only Jesus can save him. False religion and man-made rules never will. Gothard's rules can't transform anyone. They can't even transform him. What Gothard and my brother Josh need is a new heart that only Jesus can give. That's what I need. That's what we all need. Without a new heart, all the outward religious behavior isn't going to please God. The fall of Gothard is profound evidence that a ministry built on man's efforts and external righteousness will crumble. During the 1980s, the heyday of the IBLP, he was packing stadiums. Tens of thousands were attending blah, 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 seminars, making millions of donations. 
Then a couple decades later, something, something, something. It's shrunk. The IBLP is like blah, 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 blah. And she says, the teachings he promised would bring success and victory didn't. If the proof of effectiveness is in the product, then Gothard's life proves his principles don't work. Which is, that is a, a, a really wild right there. That- yeah. They're, they're- <laughs> what? Like She gets some stuff right. She gets, a, like, yes, Josh is a hypocrite. Basically, like, according to Ginger, Bill's hypocrisy, Bill Gothard's hypocrisy is equivalent to Josh's hypocrisy. Only, like, they only mention sins. Like, like it, 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 sins are, like, alluding because mm-hmm. like we all know what he did right ah. and, uh, i mean i can give her a little bit of space here because going into de- detail about what he did when that's your own brother who has a history of also harming family members that could be difficult i can maybe give her a little bit of space there but framing these things as sins rather than using the word crimes definitely gives me pause well also she says what josh and bill gothard need is a new heart that's what i need that's what we all need like it's like right. how dare you think you're better than my pedophile brother because you haven't accepted jesus that's what she's saying here right that's what she's saying that's ugh. well i i also think that her phrasing here combined with what she said earlier in the book about not becoming a true christian until she was 14 and combined with what we learned about calvinism and reform doctrine a few weeks back with the perseverance of the saints, it sounds to me like she is very gently implying that Josh is not currently saved and also that Bill Gothard may not be either. Not only is that a huge deal in Christian culture in general to say that, that is a a real big insult. It is also a major doctrinal break with the once saved, always saved, if you said the prayer, you're good theology that's more common to the IFB. Well, she's also saying here, that, combine that with what she said earlier, where basically, if somebody is that bad of an abuser, then they were never saved to begin with. That's kind of because, uh, once again, no true Scotsman. That's like her bread and yeah. butter. But I won't, I won't fault her too much for this particular instance, because this particular instance is more based in Calvinism. Well, so she goes on um, to talk about how she's she's not on TV anymore, how how her her shows got canceled or whatever, um, and how she's kind of like glad that she doesn't have to to deal with being on TV anymore, um, even though she really loved it and she she really loved the the camera crews that were there, and then she reminisces about how uh, how how close she felt with a lot of the people that were working on the show, which you know that is um, that is pretty uh, that that was nice to read. Mm-hmm. But she goes on to say that being on TV gives people license to criticize you. And this is the other place where she mentions Josh. And um, and so she says, in the case of my brother, Josh, the fall has been even more devastating because he claimed to be a man of Christian conviction. The, bashla- the backlash against his actions has been, correctly, severe. Even if he weren't a public figure, he would still be in prison for his actions. But because millions knew who Josh is, his sin gives Christ a bad name. Those who oppose Christianity can point to Josh and claim that anyone who claims to walk with Jesus is a phony. When I was younger, I didn't understand the possibility of all that criticism. I don't think anybody did. We weren't aware of celebrity culture and the way that people both admire and criticize movie stars here. Weird observation here. Once again, there's no mention in this book, particularly of what Josh's crimes are. Partially, I think that's because she assumes that if you're reading this book, then you already know what his crimes are. Right. You already know that he's a pedophile. You already know that he's like a molester. You already know that um, he's an adulterer and that he committed sexual assault against a Danica Dillon after hiring her for sex. And then he tried to run out without paying her in full. Allegedly, which we totally believe. Oh, that 100% happened, I personally think. I personally think uh, that her story is 100% true because le- legally we have to say allegedly. I don't know. It, it just seems like calling them his crimes or his sins kind of reduces them to the point where she can act like, <clears throat> well, you know, the real problem here is that people will use his crimes as a way to disparage Christianity. It's, it's a big PR issue for us. 
once again, like she goes through this, she applies no true Scotsman fallacy, her bread and butter, implying that Josh and Bill Gothard were not truly followers of Jesus because if they had been, then they wouldn't have committed those crimes. And her real lamentation seems to be that the, the criticism that has been lobbed against her family. And this criticism, I think, if it's aimed at her father, Jim Bob, who she, by the way, in this entire book, she doesn't have a sour word to say about him whatsoever. Considering that he covered for and enabled Josh's abuse for years and years and years and years and years at the expense of his own daughter's safety and then tried to prevent him from facing justice when everything came down around him. Th like this is weird because it reframes Josh's actions as like a moral failing slash hypocrisy issue rather than a systemic failure on the part of her father and the people surrounding her family. I do think there is some anger at Josh for his crimes being expressed in this passage. I, I think she is blaming him for the people that are now criticizing Christianity because of what he did. I don't think she's fully blaming the people who are criticizing Christianity because of what he did. I think she is blaming him because now he's given people reason to Christi to criticize Christianity because of what he did. Right, because people who are going to Christ criticize Christianity will look for any excuse, even if it's below the belt, even if it's a, a personal tragedy of this family. You know, just right. I I still yeah. um don't like her take. I just I see it slightly differently based on the language of this passage. And I mean, you're much you 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 speak Christianese much more fluently than I do. So I would I speak Christianese and I speak Fundy code. <laughs> yeah. So you would. I mean, you know much better than I would. Your your take is probably more accurate than mine. Um. I mean, she talks about trying like so then she goes on she talks about trying to avoid raising her children with the same fears that she was raised with when her kids ask questions about god like you know going to heaven and stuff but i don't know how that squares with calvinism because how old are her kids going to be before she teaches them about total depravity yeah what my kid's not old enough to ask that kind of questions but what am i going to tell my child about god is definitely a question i engage with as a parent but she's got a stickier situation than I do because I am not intending to teach my kid in a formal way about sin or hell or total depravity or anything like that until she's much, much older. I feel like Ginger's theology is a lot harder to explain to a kid without scaring them. That's a tough situation. If you grew up Calvinist, please send us a message about how, like, like send us an email at leavingedenpod at gmail.com to tell us about how total depravity and and predestination and those things were explained to you when you were a kid how old you were and how that was I, done because i, I would bet be there are people who have found more compassionate ways to explain this to a child i'm really interested what those would be because i i think that for every scary and hard to deal with theology out there there's probably someone who is trying their best to raise their kid with a positive self-image and a correct view of who, who they are and how, where they stand in the world. So for, for whatever theology there is out there, I'm sure there's somebody who is really making an effort to do it right. And I'm always interested in, in what those people are doing. Can I move on to the quote that absolutely made my blood boil when I read it? Yeah, this is the one where I have shut up ginger written underneath. So let's do it. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, do you want me to read this one or do you want to read it? Uh, I can read this one. Go for it. So she's speaking about people who were IBLP be and, and like left it because of this quote unquote hypocrisy of Bill Gothard. Quote, they tore their faith down to the studs and never built it back up. There's a sense in which this is the easy route. It's less work to abandon the house once you've torn it down than to lay another foundation and build it up again brick by brick. I can imagine a world where I abandoned Christian where I abandoned Christianity entirely and built a new life for my desires. But that didn't happen because Jesus saved me. His love compelled me to keep trusting him. I wish my friends knew that same love. Man. The... <sighs> there is nothing immoral, Ginger, about wanting things. It is okay if in your own religious estimation you want something and decide to not have it. That is fine. But there is nothing immoral about having a desire. She also says in this section that people who 
deconstruct and leave Christianity entirely are taking the easy way out. And this, mm-hmm. that's the part where I read that. I'm just like, man, I feel like she's negging people there almost. Like, is is that like... Speaking <laughs> of, <laughs> what? maybe, so she's speaking to people who are reading this book directly, breaking the fourth wall here. Maybe you were raised in a strict conservative religious community that raised you, and you picked up this book hoping that I was going to tell you that I had turned my back on my faith. Sorry to disappoint you, that is not my story. My story is as strong as it's ever been, not because Christianity tells me the right way to live or unlocks some key to success, but because I can find no one more compelling, more lovely, more hopeful than Jesus. Uh, skipping down... If you left man-made religion, don't replace it with a religion of your own choosing. Replace it with a person, Jesus. He's all that is left. He's all that I will ever need at the end of my story of disentanglement. Sorry to disappoint you. (laughs) That didn't sound nearly smug enough. I think we need her to be more smug in this passage. Look, she's a Calvinist. Calvinists are the most smug of all Christians. Calvinism is the religion, like, it's the religious movement of... I'm smarter than you and you're going to be tortured eternally for it. Like it's Calvinism is like if social Darwinism was combined with Christianity, (sighs) this is a section, the the next section of the book. She, she goes back and she talks about Gothard again. She talks about how, how Gothard describes a, a cult in his books. And then like in his description of a cult, he literally describes the IBLP. If that you've seen funny. any interviews about this book, Ginger keeps on saying things like, well, I'm not a cult expert, so I really can't say if the IBLP is a cult or not, but it definitely has cult-like attributes. On one hand, I'm happy that she's able to say cult-like. Uh, it's pretty common. Someone who is really close to me got out of the IFB around the same time that I did, and then they called me like in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> like six years after leaving and they called me on the phone and they said um Sadie do you ever think that maybe we were in a cult <laughs> <laughs> and I just like yeah, yes I do think that <laughs> where have you been for the last six years I sympathize that it can take a while to get to the point of being willing to use that word and I think she's definitely on that path if she's willing to say cult like but also, she could really just Google the Byte model and get her questions answered real quick. Yeah, and if you want to learn more about the Byte model, uh, we and you're just tuning into the show for the first time for this uh, Ginger Duggar special episode, check out episode 57 of the podcast. We really go through and and say what a cult is and go like aspect by aspect by aspect by aspect and really uh, 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 get into the the dirty details of that. But when she she's talking about like on her press tour, when she's talking about like, I can't say whether it's a cold or not early in the book, she brings up Jim Jones. Right. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't really talk about cult control, really. Or she kind of does. She talk like she she talks about like the, the mind control in like a sort of passive way. Almost. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. She'll talk about how Bill Gothard was not preaching the word of God and his teachings were wrong. But she will never describe him as a cult leader. She says, then she goes on to say that a sort of high control group that is led by one person who everybody follows is a recipe for disaster. And then she compares this to Jim Jones and and Jonestown and the People's Temple as an example. Ginger describes, because she describes Jim Jones and she says he managed to convince 900 people to move to Guyana and then... He convinced them to drink like, and she, uh, she, it's almost as like these were events that occurred rather than being events that were actively perpetrated by anybody. And it's ironic to me that in evangelical Christianity, which is a culture of hardcore personal accountability for everything, that she is completely allergic to assigning responsibility to anybody for anything, be it jim jones or be it bill gothard or be it like her brother it's so weird i don't know is that to do with calvinism is that to do with just like her not trying to upset people like i think it's to do with the iblp teachings on women being submissive just mm. gut reaction i think not being able to assign like this person did this bad thing and it was bad uh i think that maybe the the misogyny and the submissiveness 
but that's just my gut reaction. Because Ginger's decision to leave the IBLP and disentangle or whatever, she says that that decision kind of came after the the recovering grace mm-hmm. allegations came forward and there were just too many of them. And so her reasons for leaving the IBLP were similar to your reasons for leaving the IFB. Right. So she had personal trauma from the teachings. She had questions about the teachings that were not answered. She was on a very slow path in the general direction of leaving, and then scandals happened and that catalyzed it, which is exactly a mirror of my story. But then in this book, she turns around and she says, the Bible is 100% true, and if you read it, then you will find that it's also 100% historically accurate. Right. Remember how Calvinism got started. It's theoretically based on exactly what the Bible says, not in such a strict word-for-word way as idolatrous biblical literalism, but it still it leans in a literalistic direction that falls short of the idolatry that we discuss on this podcast. It's more of a thought-for-thought literalism. Of course, these thoughts are interpreted by people like Calvin, John MacArthur, and the countless generations of Reformed and Calvinist thought leaders between them. It is still extremely dependent on the Bible. I don't say that as an insult, but as a statement of fact. It is a theology that is built around one interpretation of specifically what the Bible says. So, according to Ginger, her religious beliefs are based in the Word and the Word alone. And definitely aren't filtered through the theological lens of a person or a pastor, such as her husband, Jeremy. She just has this matter-of-fact way of saying that it's just completely set in stone. And yeah, yeah, I think that is how she sees it. Yeah. Um, And then she goes on to say, the next thing that she says when she says that the Bible is 100% true and 100% accurate, she says, think about it, like... And, and this is a direct quote. No man could have invented the story of Jesus. It's too rare, too rich, too fascinating. She hasn't seen a lot of movies. Okay, cut her a break. But <laughs> I have one more quote that I want to read from this book, and it leads to my theory about all of this. That quote is, as long as I stay by Jesus' side, he promises I will bear spiritual fruit. He has promised to love me forever. This quote is almost hidden in a longer passage, just gushing about Jesus in general. Oh, God, this passage was just like... It was a lot. (sighs) Um, Okay, but what if this is the one thing she can't give up? She mentions so many different rules and tenets of the IBLP that she worked through in a way that is very similar to how the rest of us worked through them. The one thing she never mentions is the fear of hell or doubts about salvation. And I do wonder whether, maybe, it's not that Ginger can't give up Jesus, it's that she can't give up her fire insurance. Mm. And I do not mean that as a huge insult. We all have that one fear that we can't shake. Even a ton of my deconstruction friends who are now atheists or otherwise non-believers have that one thing that still keeps them up at night. Taking apart the belief in hell that we were taught is extremely theologically challenging. I don't want to shame anybody who has that particular fear or any other particular fear that they haven't gotten to or not ready to deal with yet or maybe doesn't even plan on tearing down in the future. It's just someplace that mine and Ginger's beliefs post-deconstruction or disentanglement have diverged really sharply, and I'm starting to wonder if that's a thing she can't take apart. Like that fear compels her to stay within Christianity somewhere, although she has left the IBLP. I wonder. I I think we're we're about at the end of the book. I've just got a couple more questions about just this book in 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 general, just before we uh before we wrap up. Do you think that Ginger knows that she is being manipulative and gaslighty? Or is that sort of thing just so common and within like conservative evangelical and fundamentalist christianity that becomes like the air you breathe and you can't see it until you are outside of it i don't think she knows that she is being religiously manipulative but there's that one paragraph that i quoted about maybe you were expecting me to say that i'm an atheist now gotcha liberals ha 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 i don't think anybody expected her to say that though like li- like right n- <laughs> nobody like, no no like one to two percent of the snarkers who have been in it from the beginning, who like were on the original free ginger message board, maybe they hoped that she would drop 
the bombshell in this book, but n- like nobody who'd been listening to her lately had that expectation or felt like that was a realistic expectation. No, I, I certainly didn't. If it weren't for that one passage, I might see this differently. That passage, though, it reads to me as like, psych atheist heathens, I made you read a whole book about Jesus. And I will give her that because I'm a Jewish man who just read a whole book about Jesus. Ironically, I read this whole book about Jesus and I learned no information about Jesus, despite the fact that I just read a whole book where all Ginger did was talk about Jesus for like the whole book. Well, I guess you weren't, you just weren't one of the five different groups of people that this book was targeting. Yeah. So Sadie, you are a, a, a deconstructorino. Um, Indeed. As, as Ned Flanders would put it. Um was there any point within your decade long and ongoing process of deconstruction that the pitch that Ginger is making in this book would have been appealing to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, which is why I think I've tried so hard in this episode not to come off like I'm snarking on people who find a spot in Christianity that feels right for them and a, and a, a form of Christianity that makes them desire to be good and do good things. I think the specific place that Ginger has landed for now is a place that a lot of us have been before and passed on through on the way to something different. Right. Cause Ginger's pitch is essentially, you don't have to do the hard work. You can just like skip to the end, which surprise, 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 isn't too far from where you were before. I don't want to come off contrarian, but I do have a different take than you do on that. I think for Ginger, she feels like she has come a really long way from where she was before. And having lived it, she probably has. I've talked before about how leaving the house in jeans for the first time was, at the time, one of the biggest things that had ever happened to me. However, I agree with you that I think it's a really bad call to imply that she is at the end or her destination at 29 years old. I think with how far she's come, there's a decent chance that she could continue to change and grow unless she puts the brakes on and prevents herself from doing so. So I feel like she's painted herself in a corner with this book. Well, when you were deconstructing, you could decide to put on pants and go for a drink at a bar without ending Mm -hmm. up on TMZ. Right. I think that this book is as much as it is like, uh, uh, this is where I am now. Um, it's also a, this is where I am now. Leave me alone. If my views change, they're going to change at their own pace. And while she didn't exactly say that she's by setting herself up as this is set in stone, she's hoping that people will stop bugging her about it. Like she's saying, this is where I'm staying. Anything else you get after this is a bonus. Mm-hmm. And maybe people, and she's hoping maybe people will stop speculating on whether or not she's going to deconstruct any further. So I have a really wild theory. I agree with the thought that this is kind of a leave me alone. If I go any further, it's going to be slow and boring and you're not going to be interested book. But did you ever think that maybe this book exists not to convince others of her new beliefs, but to convince herself? Oh, 100%. Like, what if she's scared to go any further? Whether or not she feels that she desires to go any further, maybe she's afraid to even consider it. She has so much on the line. She's gone as far as she can go without bringing her husband and kids along with her, which is a a scary scenario for a, a person whose spouse is in seminary. So instead, what if she wrote a whole book to purposely paint herself into a corner and make it harder for herself to ever publicly change any further if she ever did feel like she wanted to and solidify her reputation with peers and future employers of her husband so that they don't suspect that she is trying to go too far just my wild theory take please take that with a grain of salt that's interesting and that i mean that makes sense because None of these arguments that she's making really make any sense if you're anybody whose last name isn't Duggar. Basically, if you're somebody who wasn't raised in the IABLP and grew up on reality television. I mean, they're like, they're essentially her, these points that she's making, these arguments she's making, she's essentially just showing armor for her position. 
So I wanted to be really careful how I phrased that theory because Ginger is a young woman and young women are humans who are allowed to have firmly held opinions. I think it's really misogynist to imply that just because she is a young woman, she's going to change again in 10 or 15 more years because that plays into the stereotype that young women are fickle and untrustworthy. So please remember when we're having discussions about this, you would likely not belittle a 29-year-old man's opinions because, oh, he's just going to change again. However, 29 is pretty young and I'm 29, I'll be 30 by the time this episode comes out? No. This week, I'm turning 30. And I certainly hope I'm not done growing or changing my opinions. So it's, it, there's definitely a balance, I think, in how we talk about her potential future of change. But when we add in the factor that she has only been treated as a grown adult person for a limited amount of time, yeah, that, th those are some of the things that make me wonder if this book is maybe more for herself than for anyone else. It will be really interesting to see where she ends up in 20 years. Uh, I might really hate where she ends up in 20 years, but I might love it. Yeah, I'm along for the ride. I do hope it's a very long time before I have to read another one of her books. Well, if Ginger Duggar Vuolo writes another book then you will hear us review it here on the Leaving Eden podcast, which is why I hope she doesn't write another book because I don't want to have to read another book by her. There is an extended and uncensored and ad-free version of today's episode that is available on patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. Make sure you follow our podcast so that you get our episode coming out next week about sex influencers, Christian sex influencers. We've got, we're talking about purity culture. We're talking about Paula Morgan. We're talking about Bethany Beal, Girl Defined. We've got our friend who's a sex therapist who's going to come and dissect some of the sex advice that these uh, Christian sex influencers give out. That's going to be a good fun Valentine's Day special. If you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, you can follow us on all of the social medias. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast, on Twitter at Leaving Eden Pod. You can join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. And that's a great way to discuss this episode or anything else that is fundy related with other fans of the show. You can join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Same dealio as with the Facebook group. Sadie, do you want to plug your social media? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say if you want to... Uh, read a much more interesting account of life in the IBLP, I suggest you check out the book Lovingly Abused by Heather Heath. You can find her on Instagram and TikTok at Backslid and Harlot. And if you want more information uh, about the, the whole No True Scotsman, No True Christianity fallacy, uh, my number one resource for that is Chrissy Stroop on Twitter. She's at C underscore S-T-R-O-O-P. As far as me, you can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music, on Twitter at Hell Yes Sadie, and on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. We hope to hear you and see you next time. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye. No confusion